in Grand Rapids. He was a wine buyer for DMW Food Center for 13 years. He managed D. Schuler's wine, so wine store in Ramblewood Center for 10 years. He became the first cellar master at the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel, buying all beverages and training the sommeliers and wait staff. He has studied wines in California, Michigan, the Pacific Northwest, as well as Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. He is a Society of Wine Educators Certified Wine Educator, a Certified Specialist of Wine and holds certificates from the German Wine Academy, the Committee of Interprofessional Divorcing, I'm not saying it correctly, Wine and Foods from France, Italian Wine Bureau and the American Wine Society as a graduate wine judge. He serves as a wine judge for the Michigan Wine and Spirits Competition, Tasters Guild, International Wine Judging and American Wine Society. He's now retired but makes red wines at Tanglewood Winery in Holland. He's an amateur grape grower and a home wine winemaker. He's been recognized by the state of Michigan and the American Wine Society for his work with numerous awards. He says he and his wife Alice enjoy cooking, traveling, and drinking good wine with good friends. And I became aware of him because I have a brother in Grand Rapids who was a member of a hobbyist winemakers. And Ryan offered some of his expertise and advice to that group. And my brother told me about him. He came highly recommended. So welcome, Brian. Thank you, Teresa. And thank you all for uh, joining today. Um, I just uh, so that you know why I don't have a left ear. Um, uh, let's see, 19 or 2016, I had a really severe case of uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, this is a disease that for most people, they have it, they die with it, they don't even know they had it. Um, it's usually very slow growing and not a big deal. But in my case, it, it grew so quickly, I could literally feel and see it growing. So they had to do a really uh, radical surgery, removing a large part of my face and uh, replace that with a big chunk of uh, muscle and skin from my leg, which uh, of course filled the, the gap, but unfortunately uh, it's a different set of muscles. So you'll see me kind of talking out of the side of my mouth. It's uh, unfortunately, uh, the, it's just a matter of the, the muscles that I've got. So uh, I'll try to speak clearly and uh, Hopefully that uh, it won't, won't be an issue. Um, one of the things that I like to start with is uh, as a home winemaker, um, you know, I studied wine for a long time before I started making wine. I didn't start making wine until 1987. And um, I, I just have learned so much about wine uh, making it, even though it's a very, very simple process. If you look at a bunch of grapes, and these I just bought from the grocery store, but they look pretty much the same as grapes would look in a, uh, in a vineyard, you'll notice that there's sort of like a, a bloom or a sort of a white sort of film on them. Well, that white film is yeast. Uh, basically, uh, you know, people talk about wine kits, wine recipes, things like that. Well, wine really, uh, grapes come ready to make wine. They've got all the ingredients are right there. If the grapes are ripe, they have enough sugar. If, the, uh, if they're grown, um, even if they're grown indoors, but certainly if they're grown outdoors, um, they will have that nice bloom of yeast on the grape itself. And um, that's really all you need is, uh, and of course we have juice. You need, you need liquid, yeast, and sugar, and uh, you have wine. So I'm gonna take one grape here and cut it in two and just give you a little bit about the, uh, uh, the grape itself. You'll notice that the, uh, the the inside part, the pulp, is clear. It's and if I were to squeeze the juice out of this grape, it would also be clear. So you can make, uh, and what makes red wine red is the skin contact with the pulp. So if you're going to make red wine, you would take red grapes, whole, crush them and leave them as all together in a big sloppy mess of skins and, and some winemakers leave um, the, the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the stems in as well. Um, but at any rate, you know, the pips, everything, you just leave it all together. And after a couple of weeks of maceration, you would press it. And when you press it, you would what would come off would be really deep colored red wine. However, if you're going to make a white wine, you could use uh, yellow grapes or green grapes, 
but you could also use red grapes. You would just need to press them right after they were crushed before the wine, uh, the color bled into the, uh, into the grape. If you basically, you know, wine has been around for, it's been made on purpose for 8,000 years. And who knows how long it was made before that by, by accident. Uh, primates, uh, not only humans, but also um, chimps and uh, gorillas are the, the one species, maybe I'm not sure if it's the only species, but uh, one of the only ones at any rate that builds up a tolerance to alcohol. Um, is, it, it basically, it's one of the reasons that you in the jungle, uh, apes and chimps can eat fruit that's already uh, slightly uh, beyond its prime and not get too drunk and, and get eaten by a lion or something. Um, humans have that capacity as well. Most other animals, you might go out deer hunting and wondering why the deer don't eat all the apples that are all over the ground. Well, it's because if they're not just freshly fallen from the tree, those apples will contain alcohol and uh, the deer really can't uh, uh, consume that. So um, it takes about 2% of sugar to make 1% of alcohol. So normally when we pick grapes, we pick them at over 20% sugar. Um, so that's the, the, the key with winemaking from grapes is they have to be over 20% sugar. And one of the reasons makes it really hard to make wine out of raspberries or apples or anything else, because those fruits don't have anywhere near enough sugar. And most grapes like these that are from the grocery store probably only have about 12 or 13% sugar. They're nowhere near as sweet as wine grapes would be. So if you were to just take a bunch of grapes, throw them in a bucket, come back, month later, you'd have a bucket full of wine. It's that simple. Uh, it doesn't really require any, uh, any technology to turn grapes into wine. If you want them to taste good, there are some many steps that you really have to take to ensure that the, uh, that the wine will, the resulting wine will be good tasting. But at any rate, if you just take that bucket of wine and you know, the, the grapes, uh, basically the, the, as soon as the juice from the grape comes in contact with the yeast that's on the outside of the skin, it starts to ferment. The yeast starts eating the sugar, and as it starts eating the sugar, it gives off alcohol and carbon dioxide. If you made this, <clears throat> excuse me, this wine in an open bucket and all of the carbon dioxide evaporated out, you would have a still wine. And the word still does nothing to do with a still as in distilling. It means still as in motionless. It's sitting still. However, if you were to put a really tight fitting lid on that bucket um, before it was completely fermented, the wine inside would become carbonated and you would have sparkling wine. Uh, that's what makes sparkling wine sparkle is the fact that they've trapped some of the carbon dioxide that's uh, created during fermentation uh, into the wine. Uh, another type of wine, there's basically four types of wine, still sparkling, fortified and flavored. And uh, flavor, fortified wine is wine that's had alcohol added to it. Um, these would be ports, sherries. Um, a lot of aperitifs have alcohol added to them. And the, uh, this, this practice really got started in shipping wines from Portugal and Spain to England and eventually to India and South Africa and wherever there was English colonies or English um, uh, military uh, ex expeditions. There, they would have to ship them wine. And um, they, at that time, they weren't growing any uh, uh, grapes or making wine in England. So it all had to come from Portugal and Spain. Consequently, by the time it got all the way you know, across the Indian, Indian Ocean and even just getting it from Portugal up to England was a you know, several day trip. You know, in the summer, it was hot. Um, the wines weren't in, they were in barrels, but they weren't necessarily that well sealed or anything else. A lot of times the wine, by the time it got to England, it would be um, spoiled. And certainly by the time it got to India or South Af Africa, it was spoiled. So they um, just quite by accident, um, they had made a batch of wine that had did not fully ferment. So there wasn't enough alcohol in it to call it wine. So they added brandy to it. And um, in doing so, they added too much. And so it never did ferment. It stayed sweet and it was very high alcohol. They shipped it anyway. And needless to say, the English soldiers just loved it. And uh, the, the more uh, the alcohol there was and the sweeter it was, the better they liked it. So they started shipping wine to England uh, that was 
only half fermented and then fortified with alcohol to bring it up to a uh, proof to where it would stop fermenting. Eventually, the alcohol sterilizes the wine and it stops fermenting. And so it stays sweet. And that's how flavored wines, uh, or I mean, sorry, fortified wines are both uh, high alcohol and sweet. Because if you have grapes that are 20% sugar, let's say, when you pick them, you're going to get a wine of about 11% uh, alcohol or thereabouts. And, um, and it'll be bone dry. So the only way to make sweet wine that's high alcohol is to add the alcohol. Just a little story about um, fortified wines. I've been making wine a long time and I've been studying it uh, even longer. And I've, I've known for forever that if you put wine in a barrel, it eventually gets higher in alcohol. And um, that has never made sense to me. And I've tried to reason why on earth that would be true. And uh, I never could figure it out. And this will be a little bit of a brain teaser uh, that I'll come back to later. But just be thinking about this during the course of the seminar. If alcohol is much more volatile than water, if you had a mixture of water and alcohol and just set it out, all the alcohol would evaporate before much of the water evaporated. That's basically how you distill wine and turn it into brandy is you put a little bit of heat underneath it and the alcohol will evaporate at about 180, 190 degrees and they'll leave all the water and everything else behind so you get pure alcohol coming out of the still. So if alcohol is far more volatile and evaporates much more easily than water and um, grape juice or anything else for that matter, why is it that if you put wine in a barrel, you're going to eventually end up with some headspace because something has evaporated um, through the barrel. Why is it that the alcohol does not evaporate, but the water content does? So what you end up with a wine that's darker, richer, more alcoholic, and more flavorful and more aromatic that's in the barrel than, a, than, uh, than you started with. And, and you also increase the alcohol uh, somewhat. Um, that's a, I, I learned that at a port seminar and the, the speaker just, you know, kind of, you know, made a comment like everybody knew this and it just, I fell out of my chair just about uh, when I finally figured out, you know, when it was explained to me why this is so. Normally when we talk about barrels, we don't talk about wines that have been in barrels necessarily as flavored wine, even though barrels do flavor the wine and the, um, the more toasty the barrel is, the more you get flavors of vanilla and coffee and ch chocolate and cocoa and things like that. Whereas uh, a wine that's uh, aged in a barrel that has had very, very little toast, <clears throat> you end up with more flavors of butter and cream and lemons and uh, bananas and things like that. So typically if you're gonna be aging a Chardonnay, for example, a nice uh, rich white wine, you'd want to put it in a barrel that's probably not had a lot of toast in it so that you get those nice creamy, um, luscious creme brulee type of flavors. Whereas if you're going to age a red wine, you would actually get a lot less flavor out of the barrel if it's toasted, but the flavor you get would be these very tertiary flavors of cocoa and coffee and things like that. So we generally think of a barrel as simply something to hold the wine in. We really don't think of it as a purposeful flavoring of the wine. Uh, in Europe, they generally use barrels over and over and over again so that they're neutral, so they really don't have any flavor. Whereas in the, it was really pretty much the, um, the wine boom in the 60s and 70s where everybody was buying new barrels every year, so they really couldn't season them over a period of five or 10 years. And so uh, the wine started to taste a little bit like bourbon where they had uh, that real caramely, uh, sweet flavor from the, uh, from the oak. The Australians in particular, when their business started going like crazy, uh, became famous for wines that were considered at the time over oak. But amazingly, when they finally, their, their industry was mature enough to where they actually had enough oak barrels to seasoned oak barrels to where their wine didn't taste like oak anymore, um, people didn't like the wines as well. And uh, true in California too, many of the top end wineries put all new barrels every year for every batch of wine, which is one of the reasons that uh, it's so expensive. If they're using French barrels, they're somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,000 a barrel. 
And uh, at my winery, we use uh, Missouri oak barrels and they're about $150 a, a barrel. And we use them pretty much until they start leaking. Um, interestingly enough, uh, wine's been stored in barrels for centuries, but uh, it only has been in bottles relatively recently. Uh, it would have started in the late 1800s uh, in Europe um, with the exception of Greece. Um, that'll be another little question I'll come back to. When do you think the first, it was Butari, who was the first winery in Greece to bottle wine. When do you think Butari bottled the first Greek wine? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of illuminating when you think of a whole industry and a whole, uh, you know, Greek having been making wine for 8,000 years uh, as a civilization, such an ancient civilization, didn't adopt bottles until uh, relatively recently. Um, they just basically would bring the bottle into the store and you'd come in with your jug and fill it right out of the barrel. So the other type of wine would be a flavored wine. And as I said, we don't normally consider wines aged in oak necessarily flavored, but they, they do, the oak does have a flavor. And these would be wines like vermouth, um, may wine, things that, that actually have specific flavorings added to the wine to give it a specific flavor. Um, but Martini and Rossi, they add something like 53 different um, uh, uh, seasonings to the wine to give it a uh, special flavor. And the word vermouth means wormwood, and that's one of the woods they use, which gives it a, a distinct taste. So that's basically wine in a nutshell. But now I'm gonna hold up this little picture, and I think everybody would have gotten one of these. And this is the, uh, what we call the French Triangle. And because France is a relatively small country, but has enormous variety of climates and so forth, we can really demonstrate this really very well in a short, uh, very small distance in France. Up at the top, you've got Champagne, which is a continental climate. Continental climates give you lots of acid, not much alcohol and not much tannin. In Bordeaux, which is a coastal maritime climate, you get pretty good alcohol um, and you get lots of tannin. Tannin is that substance that is in the skins of the grape that makes, your, makes a grape feel kind of dry to the taste and makes dry red wines like uh, Cabernet Sauvignons feel dry to the palate is that uh, there's a lot of tannin. And then in the Cote de Rhone in Provence in that area and the very bottom of the picture down here along the Mediterranean, that's a much warmer, drier climate. They get a lot of ripeness. They get huge alcohols. So it's not uncommon for a good Cote de Rhone to be 15, 16% alcohol, which means the grapes were in the high 20s when they were picked. In Michigan, if we get over 20% sugar in the grapes, we're absolutely thrilled. Uh, down in the Cote de Rhone, it would be more the uh, rule than the exception to be 25 plus sugar. So you're gonna get a wine 14, 15, 16% alcohol. Um, ideally, if your vineyard is in a good location, you would not have to add sugar, acid, or um, uh, alcohol or tannin. It would, it would just come out naturally that way. In Michigan, we usually have to add sugar because our, uh, uh, our climate, uh, even though the, the grapes are absolutely fully falling off the vine ripe by the middle of October, if you're using the grapes that we use, we use early hybrids. And even with uh, you know, some of the other wineries that are growing vinifera, they, uh, those grapes are ripening in, uh, into November, but they're completely ripe, but they don't have much sugar in them. There are only usually about 17, 18% sugar. So we almost always have to add a little bit of sugar to get our sugar level in the grapes themselves up to about 22, 23%. At that point, we can make a 12, 13% alcohol wine without any problem. Um, in California, they have just the opposite problem. The grapes always ripen. They have, uh, in fact, in, in California, it's illegal to add sugar to your wine. Uh, the thinking being that if you're that bad of a horticulturalist that you have to sugar your wine, you probably shouldn't be in business. So they make it illegal to add sugar in California. They, they have no problem getting the sugars ripe on most sites, but they do have a problem with acid. And there's different ways that they can do that. They are allowed to add acidity to it if they wish to. Um, or, or they can just add some green grapes. And uh, that's another way they can get their acids up. Um, tannin, that's that big texture you get. We don't get that much of it in Michigan because although we have much, much more 
hours of daylight than they do in most of the wine regions of California. We don't have nearly as much sunlight. In the summer here, there's many days where the sun never comes out behind the clouds. Consequently, we don't ripen our tannins. And consequently, our tannins are very soft. And a lot of people like a big mouth feel. They like the wine to really attack the palate. And so uh, we are allowed to add tannin in Michigan. Um, of the wines I make, I only add tannin to one of the wines. And it's simply because it's pretty acidic. And if it weren't also balanced by the tannin, it would taste rather thin and meager by adding the tannins that taste quite robust. Um, the uh, how to taste wine. I'm gonna open a bottle of wine. Also how to open a bottle of wine. There's really three corkscrews that you're probably gonna encounter. Um, there's the typical waiter's corkscrew. And uh, I'm sorry, and this particular one is what's called a floating fulcrum. In other words, right here, which is the fulcrum, it slides up and down, which gives you a little more leverage. Another type, and this is the one I use 99% of the time, it's called a uh, pull tap. And you'll notice it's got two fulcrums, it's got a fulcrum here, and another fulcrum down further, so that halfway through pulling the bottle, and I'll demonstrate that in a second, you, you can put the other fulcrum on and then it gives you a lot more leverage. Um, uh, there's you know, a lot of screw caps now, and unfortunately, a lot of us seniors don't have the wrist strength to open screw caps. So fortunately, there are uh, uh, screw cap openers. So anyway, I cut the foil off and then, uh, let's see, you probably can't see this. Uh, I'm gonna, basically, you, you wanna get your cork screw right down the center of the cork and just screw it all the way down in so that it's pretty much buried. You can see just, you know, we really, none of the screw is showing. And with this corkscrew, this nice thing is you can put the little fulcrum on first, so you're right at that point where you've got good leverage, and uh, it doesn't take a lot of strength to get it, you know, up to here. Well, once you get to here, you run out of leverage, so you put the second fulcrum on there, and uh, you got to hold on to it, and pop pops right out. Another corkscrew that uh, if you're a wine collector that you'll find indispensable is the Aso. And uh, it's a Japanese invention. And uh, again, you need to cut the capsule off, which by the way, if you ever buy a bottle of wine that's sealed with sealing wax, you don't need to cut that off. You can punch the cork right on through it. However, you can't use an Aso corkscrew on a, um, uh, wine with sealing wax unless you uh, have some uh, I stick sealing wax off. Now this this one's a little tough. You got to kind of get put the longer tine in first. Then once you get the longer uh, tine in, you put in the shorter one and you just kind of rock it back and forth so that it's completely in like so. And once you get it in, then you just turn it and as you turn it, you kind of pull it at the same time. And the reason you, you would do this is it's a lot more trouble than a regular corkscrew, but the beauty of it is, as you can see, the, the tines are holding the cork together. So corks don't last that long. After about 10 years, they start to break down. And even though they're a perfectly good seal on the wine, um, when you go to pull them out, they, they crumble and fall apart and you can't get them out of the bottle. You end up pushing them in and you got cork in your wine and that's no fun either. So that is, those are really the corkscrews. There's all kinds of inventions. I would say the only thing to really watch out for is if there's a little like a puncher on the top of, of, of right here on the fulcrum, do not use that corkscrew. It will probably crack your bottle. Um, and the other thing, just if you're ever doing banqueting, the nice thing about this corkscrew is that unlike this one, when you open the bottle of beer, you have to, um, lift it up like that, your forearm gets really sore. The beauty of this one is with a bottle of beer, you go like that and you just the weight and gravity of your arm opens it up without any problem. So tasting wine, and I can't believe I did this, I gotta grab a glass, <laughs> right back. Can you tell us which one to open? Um, 
I, you, you can you can do this along with me if you wish, but I'm actually going to get to that later. But you can I would say open if you've got the two wines I mentioned, the two vines and the Chateau Saint Michel. Open the two vines, and I'm just going to pour it just to show you something about um, tasting. Basically, you want to give it a nice swirl. You want to use a big enough glass that if you put a few ounces of wine in it, you can swirl it without it splashing out. Uh, you definitely want a glass that is tapered at the top capture the aroma, give it a little bit of a swirl that brings the aroma to the top of the glass. Put your nose in, take a good smell. Now, as you taste it, you'll kind of notice you get different flavors as the wine filters back um, through your palate. And, uh, and, and I think the, the key is with tasting wine is just to basically pay attention. And when you taste something, try to relate it to something you know. If a wine tastes like tea, or maybe tastes like apricots, or tastes like something else that, you know, lychees or whatever, um, those are all flavors that you can relate to, and it kind of gives you an ability to kind of remember how the wine tastes in your, uh, in your brain. People learn things differently. I tend to learn things very visually, and that's one of the reasons I, uh, I sent you the um, outline of what I was gonna talk about. Because if you can kind of get that outline in your brain, as you learn things, you should be able to kind of insert them in the outline and your outline will just keep growing and growing and pretty soon you'll be indeed a wine expert. Wine, uh, uh, the reading a wine label, there's really, how are we doing our time here? Uh, I need to move up here a little bit. Basically the, the wine label is, uh, is, wines are labeled um, a few different ways. And the most common way is, uh, most traditional way is geographic. So for example, this is a bottle of Chianti Classico Reserva Kirkland, it's from Costco. And uh, this particular bottle would be what you'd call a geographic label. It tells you where it is, precisely where it is from. And uh, kind of combining three and four here together, the reading a wine label and wine laws, is that in Europe, all of the wines that have a place name also have a uh, sort of a formula, if you will, or a tradition. So traditionally, uh, Chianti, and specifically Chianti Classico, um, is an area within Chianti. It, it, it is spelled out what your, your maximum yields, what kind of grapes you can grow, and even how you make the wine. That's all spelled out. So if you buy a bottle of wine that says Chianti, and even more specifically Chianti Classico from the prime part of the region, then you know exactly what you're getting. I mean, it doesn't matter who makes it or what brand, it's gonna more or less have the same characteristic. Quality will vary from one uh, producer to another. And then Reserva speaks mostly both of the quality, but more importantly of how it's been uh, aged. So that would be a geographic wine label and it would also um, ascribed to the laws, the local laws, uh, Mer uh, Appalachian Contrôle in France, Denominazione de Origin uh, Controllata in Italy, and so forth. Uh, next wine that I'm going to show you is a varietal label, actually a couple of them. One, both of the wines that you have, the Two Vines Merlot and the Saint Michel Merlot, are what we call varietal wines. And I'll get to those in a minute, but just a basic varietal wine. We have a wine that, like this one says, Garnacha del Fuego. Doesn't say where it came from, doesn't say anything about it other than it's made from Garnacha. Del Fuego just means of the, of the flame. So it's the, the Garnacha of the flame or the fiery Garnacha, I guess. But it tells you nothing about it um, other than the fact that it is made from Garnacha grapes. In this particular case, it's a Spanish wine, it comes from Spain. And the same producer produces another wine and this one right here says Monastrel, which is the region. So it tells you not only what grape it comes from, but what region as well. Um, and uh, another brand, another type of labeling is proprietary. And uh, it's kind of the mother of invention for a lot of reasons. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the names of a lot of grapes are not familiar. Like all the grapes that I grow, you've probably never heard of things like Maréchal Foch and Leon Mio and Saint-Croix. 
and Marquette, et cetera, et cetera. These are, and so if I make a wine, if I put those names on the label, they would mean nothing to, to anybody. Whereas if I were to call it something like Reserve Red or Lakeshore Breeze or something like that, people would remember the name. And, and even though the main name means absolutely nothing, it does, um, it does mean something to, uh, to whoever drank the wine and has experience with it. So that would be a proprietary wine. I mean, just an example of one of the proprietary, and proprietary wines can also be fairly specific. One of them is uh, a, a word that has legal definition is the word meritage. And it's not meritage, it's not a French word, it's meritage, it's an American word, it's not even an English word, it's an American word, it's a made up American word between merit and heritage. It's a meritorious wine. In other words, the, one of the top wines from the winery made from Bordeaux heritage grapes. The grapes that were grown in Bordeaux pre phylloxera and I'll get back to phylloxera in a, in a minute. But prior to the scourge of the late 1800s, there were eight grapes that were grown in Bordeaux. There would be Cabernet Sauvignon, which is actually a cross of Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. But basically Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Petit Verdot, Malbec, uh, Carmenere, Gros Verdot, and Saint Macaire. And those um, grapes are what are called Bordeaux heritage grapes. So the word meritage, merit and heritage. Um, and a wine that's made from those grapes, and it doesn't have to be made from all of them, at least two of them, and no more than 90% of any one of them can, be, can call itself meritage. And uh, there's meritage wines made all over the world. We have in Michigan, they have mostly California, Washington is where you see most of the uh, meritage uh, wines. And they tend to be a, a, what I would call a proprietary blend, such as Opus One, Cane Five, um, uh, uh, what's the big one, uh, Magnificat. Uh, these are all names of meritage um, uh, wines. Um, Another word too that's out there that you'll see on labels is old vine. It has no meaning anywhere in the world, no legal meaning. I mean, it basically means, you know, I, I just means the grapes are, the vines are old, but it, you know, the, the definition of old is up to the, uh, uh, the eyes of the beholder. So there's only one country that takes uh, this seriously. Think about that a little bit, and then we'll come back to that too. There is only one, one, one place in the world there where old vine actually means something. And there's really no place in the world that Reserve or Reserva has specific definitions other than Italy and France where it, there are minimums, but normally a Reserva from uh, uh, say Spain would be maybe five, six years old. And it, it only has to be, I think uh, 18 months or something. So it's it does have some bearing, but uh, but not a real specific. And in the United States, the word reserve or reserve means nothing. Uh, one of my wines I call reserve red. It, it, it's, it, it means absolutely nothing other than it's a name that I thought would stick. Terroir. This is uh, probably one of the most important aspects. And I think to enjoy wine, you really need to be a terroirist of uh, understanding how the wine uh, comes about. And in, uh, in Michigan, for example, we have very distinct terroir. Right around here in Ottawa County, most of our terroir is what they call blueberry country. Very low, poorly drained, um, uh, frost prone, um, very early season. Uh, you, if you don't have your grapes in by October 1st, you're not going to get them. Um, there's all kinds of problems with growing grapes in Ottawa County. And so for the most part in Ottawa County, we grow early hybrid grapes, which are a cross between wild grapes and grapes that, are, um, that come from Europe. Vinifera are grapes that come from Europe. Wild grapes are usually uh, things like you know, hybrids and uh, are, are things like Norton and Concords and Catawbas and things like that. But by crossing multiple species, you get a hybrid that will grow well, like Marquette will grow down to 40 degrees below zero uh, it was developed in Minnesota, but at the same time, um, produce a wine that tastes not quite like wild grapes, a little bit more like uh, civilized or cultured grapes. And so I make all of my wine from hybrid grapes because that's the only thing I can grow. Um, further to the north, up in the Traverse City, really from about Hart going north, um, 
they're seasoned, they're, they're, they're higher, well-drained soils. And by being higher, they get less frost. The air tends to drain off the hills rather than you know, stagnating in pools where it uh, causes frost damage. And further south, uh, there's, a, there's a ridge actually starts just north of Benton Harbor, runs all the way to, um, actually, I'm sorry, just south of Benton Harbor, runs all the way to Kalamazoo. It's called Lawton Ridge, L-A-W-T-O-N, Lawton Ridge. And the closer you get to Kalamazoo, the higher it is. Towards uh, the, one of the vineyards I used to buy from um, uh, is, is located on Lawton Ridge. Uh, it's, it's actually called Lawton Ridge Winery. And uh, it is a, uh, it's very warm up there. Uh, they tend to be able to ripen, you know, Cabernet, you know, Merlot, Riesling, you name it, they can ripen it. We can't possibly ripen those varieties where, where I'm at. And, uh, and that's really the key. You can't make wine if your grapes aren't ripe. Um, tradition also is a big factor of uh, terroir. Uh, the way, you know, as I said, with the case of like the Chianti or the Bordeaux, they not only dictate how, if you're going to use the word Bordeaux on your label, if you use the word Chianti on your label, not only do you have to limit your yields to a certain amount that's considered uh, qualitative, but you also have to use certain varieties, certain winemaking methods and so forth to make a wine that's typical of the region. Um, and we'll get to that when we talk about quality at the end. We uh, should move on here a little bit. Food and wine pairing concept, uh, wine and health. Uh, not to say too much about that other than the famous U curve, which if you have on one side morbidity and the other side, how many glasses of wine you drink, there is, it's different with individuals, but there's a sweet spot somewhere where somewhere between one and three glasses of wine a day will lengthen your life, you'll be healthier and be much the better off uh, for it. Um, in excess of that can be, depending on you know, your DNA and things like that, it can be bad. In Denmark, they say a bottle of wine is ideal per day. Um, same with, uh, with France. Um, but yet a bottle of wine for most Americans would be too much. Uh, in a day. So it's hard to say what that perfect spot is, but, but unless you can't drink wine, and that's about 93% of, uh, of the people on the planet, about 93% of the people can drink wine. If they can, um, you know, a glass or two uh, a, a day is, is very helpful. And there's been just all kinds of experiments and study on why that's so, and there's lots of reasons, but in general, it has to do mostly with the, uh, the, the fermentation that's going on in the barrel and, and in the tank and whatever, and also the skin of the grape. A lot of um, phenolics in the skin are, are very um, uh, healthy for you. Um, wine and food pairing, you know, traditionally, you know, if somebody's having an Italian dinner, you're gonna have a bottle of Italian wine, why not? And uh, typically the traditional cuisine fits with the, cuisine, uh, the traditional wines. People made wines that go well with with the, with, the, with the foods they eat. And in past years, people didn't travel much and not wine was ship was, wasn't, wine wasn't shipped around too much. And consequently, the style of wine grew up as a factor of the uh, cuisine. So certainly a geographic pairing would be simply having a Lebanese wine with a Lebanese dinner or an Italian wine with Italian dinner, et cetera. Another thought is sameness, especially when you get into more, um, modern cuisine where there isn't anything specifically traditional. Um, if you have a light, uh, uh, a light food um, uh, that's, uh, that's you know, very delicate like a chicken, you might say, well, I might want a white wine, but do I want a rich white wine or a mild white wine? And depending on, the, on how the chicken is made, if it's just, um, you know, let's say sauteed chicken breast or something, you know, maybe a very nice light fresh wine would be ideal. On the other hand, if it's got a nice cream sauce with pine nuts and mushrooms in it, you might want, uh, or like a lot of herbs in it, you might want a big red wine even with, uh, with chicken. So basically trying to match it is more a, a matter of pairing both the sameness and the intensity, the sameness, thinking of like a, uh, let's say a, a pork chop with uh, blueberry um, compote on it. Well, you might actually want a blueberry wine or you might want a wine like the Zinfandel that has some blueberry components to it. Um, 
On the other hand, equal intensity is usually a good a good barometer. If the if the if the dish you're eating is very very full and you know rich and you know like a big roast beef or something, you want a big wine uh, as well. And uh, certainly the opposite of that works too. Where if you have let's say uh, let's say you have some really spicy Asian cuisine, you wouldn't necessarily want to have a real spicy hot wine. You'd want something to put the fire out, maybe a nice cool wine like a, a Moscato or a Gewürztraminer or a Riesling or something like that that's going to soothe the palate rather than inflame it. And then finally, if all four of the things I just told you sound self-contradictory, well, they are. And so really the only thing that matters is, why, is, uh, is reason number five, which is personal preference. If you like the wine, you'll probably like it with whatever you're eating. Uh, that seems to be the, the, the thought. So now we're going to get into what is quality. And uh, I selected these two wines. And you can open up, uh, you can open up if you've got two or four wines, you can open them all if you like, or a couple of them, whatever you choose. The two wines I wanted to make sure that you did open and try is the uh, Two Vines Merlot and the Chateau Saint Michel. Now this is what we would call a mass producer. Uh, they're a huge company. They have uh, uh, vineyard contracts all over the West Coast. And the first wine, Two Vines California Merlot, this is a wine made in Washington, in Prosser, Washington, but made with grapes that um, are grown in California. And because it's an inexpensive wine, and because it does not say where they're growing, it doesn't say Napa Valley, it doesn't say Sonoma, it doesn't say Paso Robles, it doesn't say Monterey, it doesn't say where these grapes come from, we can assume it doesn't come from one of the quality wine regions. We can assume it comes from the Central Valley where they grow grapes pretty much the same way they grow corn in Nebraska. It's uh, just row after row of uh, vines as far as the eye can see. They're all planted in space so that they can all be produced uh, uh, grown mechanically, they get something in the neighborhood of maybe eight tons per acre. Um, their, their main objective is to grow a lot of grapes, not necessarily to make fine wine. But in spite of that, um, this producer, it has a very bent towards making quality products. I would say this wine is pretty darn good for a wine that would sell um, well under $10. Uh, you'll see it occasionally as little as $5.99. I think it was about $8.99 or thereabouts at DW uh, this week. But uh, it has a nice smell, it smells like Merlot. Nice texture. I mean, there's nothing special about it by any means, but it is um, uh, very pleasant. It's uh, that's that's really as far as I would go with it. Just saying, it's a it's a serviceable, workable wine. Well, what would being that both of these wines I'm going to show you are mass produced? What would the difference be? Well, the difference is on the Chateau Saint Michel. This is from a specific quality region of um, that straddles Oregon and um, uh, Washington, the Columbia Valley. Part of it is in Oregon, and part of it is in uh, Washington. The particular winery is located in Washington, and uh, they make all of their wines between Prosser and um, uh, Grange and Patterson. They've got several plants in that area, and uh, they make, I mean, just for example, Columbia Crest, H3, um, Hot to Trot, um, yeah, Columbia Crest, Two Vines. Uh, lots of wines are, these are mega wineries, and we really have to credit Chateau Saint Michel and also some of the growers in Australia back in the early 60s, um, it became obvious that you couldn't mass produce quality the way they were doing it, let's say in Napa Valley, for example, where a grower would have a site like Robert Mondavi where he could make superlative wines. However, he wanted to make millions of cases of wines. So he started buying grapes from here and there and putting his, uh, his ingenuity into it and making as good a wine as he could. But nonetheless, it was never as good as the wine that actually came from the vineyards right there in uh, St. Helena and Oakville. And so consequently, you had a brand that was known for high quality, but putting that brand on wines that were maybe not so high quality, and it really kind of confused the customer and um, I think it really denigrated the, the, the better brand. I think today, Robert Manavi does not 
uh, command the prestige it deserves. The actual Robert Mondavi Napa wines are superb wines, but I think people see all the other stuff with Robert Mondavi name on it and uh, assume it's just a bulk producer of ordinary wines. So one of the ways that Chateau St. Michel and the Australians managed to get around this was to go into it with the idea they're gonna mass produce quality. They're gonna make quality wines on a large scale. And they've generally succeeded in understanding what makes quality wine high quality and employing those things in vineyard locations and vineyard um, uh, uh, organizing the vineyard in such a way that they can produce pretty high quality wines and make millions of cases. And a good example of that would be the Chateau Saint Michel. I'm going to sit that down a minute. And so I'll pour a little bit of that. And the only real difference is where the grapes came from. Same winery, same winemaker. And I think you just see it just has a much more interesting nose. I mean, the nose is just so much more complex. It, it just, it speaks of the place. When you smell the Chateau Saint Michel wine, I mean, you set, when you do this, the two vines, it just smells like wine. When you smell the Chateau Saint Michel wine, if you've ever been out to uh, Washington, I mean, it smells like Washington. It specifically has that essence that you get from, from place. And so I think that's, it, it speaks, when you say a wine has somewhere in it, it speaks of its terroir. Big finish, very silky, but long. You can kind of count to five or six and it's still there and still very, uh, very pleasing. Um, and so typicalness is a, is a factor of quality. And Italy came up with a, 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 a particular, I'm gonna take my hat off, it's a little warm here. Uh, Italy came up with a, a, a classification of wines that were not necessarily made, let's say it started in Chianti because a lot of the growers there wanted to add Cabernet Sauvignon to their Chianti, which was very, very highly frowned on as Cabernet Sauvignon is considered a French grape, which Italians were not too keen on uh, allowing that into their flagship uh, region. However, it did improve their wines. And so a lot of people started doing it anyway. Of course, they couldn't call their wine Chianti because it's, it was forbidden. So they came up with a regional name IGT, uh, Indicazione Geografica Tipici, which basically means it's, uh, it's typical of the region. And so um, these wines that have other grapes added to them taste like where they come from, but they don't necessarily taste like Chianti. So a uh, IGT wine such as Sasakaya or Tignanello, I mean, these are great, great wines, the so-called Super Tuscans. They're, they're not allowed to be called Chiantis, but they're wonderful wines. And uh, just about every region now has a, a, a classification for typical wine. And that's generally considered a quality if the wine tastes like where it, where it comes from. In the United States, we have what we call AVAs. Um, uh, and, and these are um, uh, vineyard area, AVA. I can't think what the A starts, uh, stands for what would uh, oh American viticulture area duh uh, so at any rate it, it simply means it's an area where that is defined in some way or another Napa Valley is is a defined quality region in California however you can grow any kind of grape you want in California however because the property is so valuable and it's so highly regarded it's you will see really not a lot of wine coming out of Napa Valley that isn't either Chardonnay or Cabernet Sauvignon. And the reason for that is, is that the property is so expensive that unless you're getting at least $25, $30 for a bottle of wine, you can't afford to operate there. The only wines that typically command that kind of money are Chardonnays and, um, uh, and uh, Cabernets. So AVA in America, that would be, uh, you know, that just simply defines the place. In Germany, um, in most regions, it defines only the place, although they have a much more limited number of grapes that they grow. Basically, they grow Pinot Noir and um, um, Lemberger are probably the two red grapes they grow. And then uh, in um, white grapes, they grow a lot of Muller Turgau 
some Sylvaner, a fair amount of Riesling, a little bit of Gerich Demeter. And so stylistically, no matter what grape they use, usually you're gonna get a pretty, if it says it's a Rhein-Hessen or a Rheingau or a Mosel, you're, it's pretty predictable what it is. And they, they further uh, grade it because ripeness is such a difficult thing to achieve in Germany, they further grade the ripeness of the wine as well. So you know whether the wine is going to be natural alcohol or added uh, sugar like we do for the most part in, uh, in Michigan. The most important thing though about quality wine in my opinion is, um, is value. And um, one of the things that, so like in this Chateau Saint Michel, a lot of different wines, probably the best value of the bunch is their Columbia Crest label. Um, they frequently have this at Costco for $5.99, if you can imagine. And this is, in my opinion, it's the same quality as Chateau Saint Michel. I think it tends to be more in what we call an international style, where it's more the very fruit forward, uh, plump varietal flavor, a little less emphasis on the Pacific Northwest essence that I think the Santa St. Michelle tends to capture that essence of the Pacific Northwest a little better. But quality wise, I would say Santa St. Michelle and Columbia Crest are of the same quality. And like I said, you can see this every now and then at Costco for $5.99. Um, Chateau St. Michel Indian Wells. This is a, a specific vineyard in the Columbia Valley that uh, is highly regarded, making uh, great wines. And then another appellation, Horse Heaven Hills, uh, H3, HHH, Horse Heaven Hills, uh, H cubed, I guess. Um, this is uh, uh, another wine produced by St. Michel um, wineries. And, uh, and again, very high quality and a very distinct taste. The Horse Heaven Hills in particular, I think you'll find uh, truly tastes like where it, where it comes from. I'm just about there. I, I, one other thing I wanted to mention, and I'm gonna open the Horse Heaven Hills and the St. Michel cab. And the reason I'm gonna do that is that I think Merlot has gotten a bad name. And the reason it's gotten a bad name is not because it doesn't produce superlative wines, but because horticulturally it is pretty adaptable. And so you can grow Merlot in a lot of places where you can't grow cab. Consequently, um, they do grow it just about anywhere. And consequently, you get a lot of wines made in um, areas that are not high quality. And consequently, Merlot has kind of a bad reputation as being an ordinary wine. However, grown in the same climate and soil as a Cabernet, I, I think Merlot is not only its equal, I think in many, many cases, particularly in Bordeaux, France, it is superior to Cabernet. And that's why in Bordeaux, it's mostly Merlot. They do grow some Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc, but most of their wines will be predominantly uh, Merlot, something because in that particular climate and soil and so forth, it grows better. And the reason you wonder, well, why did it grow better? Well, it's um, earlier ripening. And so when you get the fall rains, um, you can generally get your Merlot in before it starts raining. Um, and it also tends to uh, bud out earlier. However, if you're in an area that has a problem with frost, uh, like the left bank of Bordeaux, you can't grow much Merlot there because it will, it, you'll, you'll get nip, nipped in the bud, but you can grow cab. Cab takes longer to ripen, but it comes out later. And so on, it, there is one little area of uh, Bordeaux that's quite famous where they grow Chateau Lafitte and Chateau Margaux, et cetera, where they actually do grow a, a, a very healthy supply of Cabernet Sauvignon because it will ripen there and they won't lose their crop due to uh, early frost. But that's pretty much the mother of nature is the, is the necessity for what, um, for what, uh, what we grow where. Uh, and in Michigan, like I said, we can't grow any of those things, so we grow hybrids. Just one other little point. I think I sent this out too. A little picture of uh, corks. Did I send this out? I did. Okay, good. I always like to describe corks as a uh, like a cookie cutter. You roll out your dough, you take your cookie cookie cutter, and you cut out the dough, and that's how they make corks. They peel the bark off the tree. It does not kill the tree. Most of the forests in um, Europe, uh, Southern Europe and Northern Africa 
our um, national forests, and they are cork forests. And uh, the reason they can afford all these beautiful national forests and not turn them over to development is the fact that the trees have value and they don't die when they peel them. And the, when they peel the tree, it's funny going through there. It looks literally like a French poodle that's just coming out of come out of the coiffure. It's uh, you know it's it's literally the tree is naked except for where the bark is. And uh, fortunately, it does not kill the tree. It can take depending on the length of the cork. Um, they just lay they unpeel it, they lay it out, they punch it out the corks, and then with what all the stuff that's left over, they grind that up and they make what's called uh, agglomerated corks or technical corks. And those are becoming more and more popular. I think both of the wines that we yeah, both of these wines are what they call technical corks. These are not punched out. These are what's left over after they punch out the corks that they use. I'm guessing probably the Indian Wells probably has a real cork in it. So corks have gotten expensive. A real cork is now about 50 cents, whereas these agglomerated corks are, are about eight cents. So it's a big, big difference. Uh, there's just a, a little bit of a limitation. And so the, the question is, is knowing that the cork forests are supported by the cork industry and it, it contributes to the health and well-being of the environment in the Mediterranean, what is better, corks or screw caps? Well, screw caps are actually a better closure. I would much rather have a screw cap on a wine, but then of course the cork industry would go out of business and maybe the national forest would get cut down, who knows? But uh, just a thought, uh, in general, with most of the... Uh, experiments that have been done, screw caps are better. It's just a matter of, um, I don't know, screw caps have a kind of a, a connotation of cheap wine, even though uh, there are lots of expensive wines that have uh, screw caps. So I've got one other question or one other thing um, uh, about the, um, oh, uh, when I talked originally about the wine that was, um, uh, when you make red wine, you make it from the skin of the grape. Um, one of the reasons there's so many blends is there are grapes that were used for making rosé and blush wine. Uh, that was very, very popular, if you remember, in the 70s and 80s. Blush wine, white Zinfandel. Zinfandel is such a black grape that it is almost impossible to make white wine out of it. So when they take the Zinfandel and they crush the grapes and extract the juice to make white Zinfandel, it usually doesn't come out very white. It comes out with a stain. And that was originally considered a flaw. Um, sort of the story of white Zin is that um, Bob Trincaro, who bought a, a very rundown, beat up old winery called Sutter Home, um, and uh, he was a, an avid home winemaker originally, and that's what got him into the wine business. And he was a judge at various wine uh, competitions. And uh, one of the wines he tasted was just absolutely phenomenal. And so uh, he found a, the, the, got a hold of the winemaker, found out how he made his wine, and he made it by the sagny, which literally in French means bleeding uh, process, where he would take, let's say, a thousand pounds of grapes, take 500 pounds, crush them and press them, discard the juice and take what was left, the cake that was in the press and dump it into the other grapes, making a bigger, blacker, darker, richer Zinfandel. I mean, Zinfandel is already a very, very dark grape, but then on top of that, adding extra skins by bleeding off the juice made these wonderful wines. And if you remember in the 60s and early 70s, Zinfandel was just, I mean, you could put a spoon in it. It was as black as black coffee and huge alcohol, 15, 16, 17%, monstrous wines. Meanwhile, they had all this juice that they pulled out of the press. And uh, Bob Trincaro at Sutter Home, he used to sell it in bulk at the winery and just to get rid of it. He would sell it, people come in with their jug and started selling better and better. And finally got to the point where he decided he might want to bottle it. And so uh, he consulted his friend, Daryl Cordy, who owned a, no a number of retail stores in the Sacramento area, and says, you know, I've, I've got all this juice that I basically, you know, I'm just getting rid of because I don't know what the heck to do with it. But in order to make my Zinfandel bigger and blacker and darker and richer, I end up with all this, you know, uh, very tasteless, semi-sweet, weak juice. 
And uh, what am I going to do with it? And uh, Daryl Cordy tastes it and says, well, I can sell this stuff. So they bottled it up. And they say, well, what are we going to call it? And he said, well, we'll call it white Zinfandel. But Bob's looking at it and says, yeah, but it's flawed. It's got, it's pink. It's not white. He says, if we put it in green bottles, nobody will notice. And as they say, the rest is history. Uh, that's why for years and years and years, white Zinfandel was always in a green bottle. So you wouldn't see that it had the flaw of a little bit of color. And uh, it became very, very popular. Well, eventually that fad faded. And so they've got all these Zinfandel grapes out in California. So what are they going to do with it all? And meanwhile, they had planted a couple of very promising grapes, Syrah and Petite Syrah, because it seemed as though those were grapes that uh, would, would catch on because they were, they were just ideal for California. The climate in California is perfect for Syrah and Petite Syrah and Zinfandel, by the way. So what are we going to do with all these grapes now that nobody's drinking white Zinfandel and Syrah and Petite Syrah never caught on? And uh, they came up with these blends. Menage a Trois was one of the first blends to really catch on and take the world by storm. And now if you go into the grocery store, you'll see the blended section is probably the biggest wine section in the, in the grocery aisle, simply because they got all this Zinfandel, Syrah, and Petite Syrah that they need to get rid of. And lo and behold, they make fabulous wines, but uh, nobody will buy Zinfandel because they're thinking white Zin, you know, kind of a garbage wine, or they're thinking Syrah, Petite Syrah, you know, they're thinking, eh, just garbage grapes. And consequently, it's hard to sell any of those grapes when in fact, they're probably should be the premier grapes of California. The climate is perfect for Syrah, Petite Syrah, and Zin. And that's what most of the blends that you buy in the grocery store will be blends of those grapes. And usually they'll add a little cabra Merlot in it to give it a little bit of, of tannin as well. So I'm going to open it up to uh, questions. And first of all, actually for the answers, what was, the, why do you think um, barrels, putting wine in barrels increases the alcohol instead of diminishing it? Anybody got a, a, got a, got a, a guess? I'll give you a hint. If you know physics and molecular... Uh, uh, <laughs> this is Wally I do have a comment to make. Sure. I think it is a secondary fermentation, the malolacto fermentation that is producing more alcohol. Nope. Nope. That's usually done before it goes into the barrel, or if it is in the barrel, it um, malolactic fermentation really doesn't add alcohol. What it adds, it changes the malic acid, which is a very bitey bite acid, into lactic acid, which uh, gives a smoother taste. I have a guess here in the chat. Somebody, uh, Steve Pemilton says barrel absorbs the water. Um, a, a tiny, tiny amount, but that's not, that's normally you saturate the barrel first so that it doesn't leak. So normally you fill the barrel with water, make sure it's fully saturated. So the amount that it, of water that it absorbs per se would be just about zero. Well, I'll give you the answer. Water is a very small molecule. The pores in a barrel are very, very small, tight pores. Water will actually go through the pores in a barrel and evaporate. H2O is a very tiny molecule. However, alcohol and all of the smells and flavors are all phenolics. And they're huge multi-chain molecules that are just too big to go through the pores. So alcohol, even though if the barrel were open, it would evaporate in a second, it can't fit through the pores. And so it does not evaporate. And so as you take a barrel of wine and about every month you need to add about 1% back to the barrel because the water keeps evaporating. Of course, as the water keeps evaporating, you keep adding more wine. Um, over time, your wine becomes more and more alcohol because you're basically adding alcohol, but losing water. And it tends to be more flavorful and more aromatic for the same reason that all of the uh, compounds that create smell and taste are great big molecules as well, and they don't uh, fit through the uh, through the pores. <laughs> Thank you for that. I just um, your prediction was correct. You have a lot of questions in the chat. Okay. You probably have twenty. Do you want okay. me to just start asking them to you? Sure, sure. That's in good. In from which they receive. Um, Explain what ice wine is. And if you've answered something in your presentation, just let me know. Exp okay, no, explain no, what ice not. wine is, dessert wine. Okay. I ice hear wine. these terms frequently and don't understand the meanings. Right. 
Dessert wine is, is wine which has such a high sugar content that it does all the sugar doesn't ferment out. Basically, when grapes are fermenting, they'll go to about 15, 16 percent. And then the alcohol that they produce basically kills themselves. They, um, the alcohol that is produced during fermentation creates a sterile environment that the, uh, that the yeast dies in. And so uh, if the wine, let's say in Sauterne, for example, uh, where the grapes are very shriveled up and very ripe, or in certain parts of Germany where they pick Trockenbeer and Auslese, these grapes are so ripe that even after they ferment out, there's still a lot, a lot of residual sugar. Um, in Germany, they also have a process, and, and really this is, any, any cold climate can do this. The north shore of Lake Erie in Canada is very famous for its ice wines. What they do is they allow the grapes to um, freeze on the vine. Well, by the time they get freezing weather, which is usually late October, early December, these grapes are very dehydrated and very, very high in sugar. They oftentimes have a mold on them besides, which sucks out, the mold is like a little plant. It sucks the water out of the grape without destroying the skin or um, removing anything else. It just sucks the water out. So you get these grapes that are extremely high in sugar and then they ferment them and at somewhere around seven or 8%, there's so much alcohol in there and so much sugar, the yeast dies and it uh, ends up at a seven or 8% alcohol wine that's extremely sweet. And that would be an ice wine. Uh, by the way, in Sauterne, France, they make ice wine in freezers. Basically, what they do is they pick the grapes just like they would in Germany when they're very, very overripe. And their climate is such that they get the, the mold naturally and they get very, very ripe fruit uh, quite naturally as well because the mold sucks all the water out. So they end up with very, very high sugar contents. Then what they do is they put them in the grapes into a freezer. And as soon as they're hard frozen, they run them through the crusher and presser. And in the running it through the crusher and the press, it squeezes the, the water content of the grape is frozen solid. So the only thing that gets squeezed out is that very rich, sugary, juicy mix in there. Then they make wine out of it and they end up with a wine that's both high in alcohol and very sweet. And so with the sauterne, you kind of get your cake and eat it too. With an ice wine, you get the the high uh, sugar, but you don't necessarily get the alcohol. Um, uh, and, and so uh, generally with an ice wine, it's going to be higher acid also, which is one of the reasons that ice wines will last pretty much forever. If you, I, I've opened myself ice wines back to the 1930s and 40s that were still uh, absolutely delicious uh, and still fresh because they are so, the, the acid is so bright because the grapes really aren't that ripe until you freeze them, until they are naturally frozen. And when they press them, all the water stays behind. So you end up with a very, very tiny, tiny yield, uh, which makes the wines very expensive and very sweet. Mm -hmm. That's actually a good lead in um, <laughs> wines dating back to 1930. The question is, does wine ever really go bad? Um, it doesn't go bad in the sense like eating spoiled meat will um, be a bad idea. Uh, so no, you can drink wines that are very old. And in fact, anybody that would like to go to my website at some point, I have an article in there called Dead or Alive. And there's wines that for whatever reason, I've, I've kind of gotten lost in the cellar and I open them up long after they should have been drunk. And I've never had one that was so spoiled I couldn't even taste it. But certainly wines do have a shelf life. And um, for most wines that you would buy, I would say 10 is a good maximum and uh, probably three is a good minimum. Um, one of the sites that I buy a lot of wine from online is called Last Bottle. And it's basically lots of wine that um, sellers have had a hard time selling. And so it's got a little bit of age on it. And they're usually fairly expensive wines that uh, they've marked down. I mean, they're like $150 wines that go for 50 and $30 wines that go for 12. So they're, uh, they have a, a, a wide variety and like the $12 wines, you have to buy six to get free shipping. Uh, the more expensive stuff, you buy three or four and you get free shipping. Some of them as little as two. I bought a wine the other day that was like 150 bucks marked down to 50 bucks. And I only had to buy two bottles to get free shipping. 
So those are that, that's a, a way to get some wines that are already usually five, six years old when you get them, uh, which is nice. Uh, you don't have to wait forever. But uh, my, my theory is that if you had 520 bottles in your cellar, you could open one bottle a week for 10 years and your average age would be 10 years on the wine. And so I've certainly got more than 520 bottles in my cellar, but I generally try to keep at least 500 serious wines that I'm planning to age. Uh, the other wines, you know, I, I drink much, uh, we drink much more uh, sooner and quickly, but uh, it's interesting. Some of the wines that you would never believe would be good um, are, are oftentimes quite tasty and they certainly won't hurt you. It won't, they, don't, they never spoil as far as uh, being um, hazardous to your health. Let's put it that way. They might taste like vinegar or mud or whatever. But the, and the other thing too, is if you go to my website, look under decanting. That's very, very important. If you open a bottle of wine that has set in one place, even if it's fairly young, it will throw a pretty good sediment. And uh, the sediment uh, it, it can really spoil the taste of the wine. The wine can be absolutely brilliantly flavored and brilliantly aromatic. But if you get a lot of sediment in it, the wine looks muddy and tastes muddy. And so you really wanna separate the wine from the uh, sediment. That's, that's quite important. If you're tasting older wines, it's not, most of the wine you would buy in the supermarket would you would never need to need to decant. Okay, right. next question. When opening a bottle, is it appropriate to cut the foil totally off the top of the bottle? It is. I, I don't do it. I, I'll actually, I'll show you a bottle. I'll show you how I like to do it. Um, and this is just for show. This has nothing to do with good etiquette or anything else. Let's see if I can slow this down a little bit. Well, anyway, I'm going to show you what I, I basically I cut the top of the foil off first. And peel can you lift up the bottle, like, please? Like that, so you can see it's Thank you. cut off just the top and peeled. And then I take the knife and cut around the, make like a ring. So I've got like a little O-ring. So you know, I've got the little O-ring there. Mm -hmm. Take that O-ring and put it off to the side. And then I open the cork. I put the cork in the little O-ring, and there you got a bottle of wine at attention, just like a little soldier with his bayonet on his shoulder. <laughs> it's just kind of a nice presentation, I guess. I started doing that at the Amway when I worked there because people would see the cork and you put it down and there's like, well, what am I supposed to do with it? You know, am I supposed to eat it or smell it or what? And there's really nothing much about the wine you can tell by the cork. Even the worst corks, you know, sometimes the wines are wonderful. So uh, I started just putting it on the cork. So if they really want to look at it and sniff it or touch it or whatever, they can do so. But at the same time, it kind of removes that awkward moment where you present the cork, which I thought was always kind of phony in my opinion. <laughs> So the next question, um, you provided the participants with an outline. I actually was not privy to that outline. Mm. Um, if anybody in the class has it and you can send it to timmer at hope.edu, just shoot it over to me. And then uh, there's a couple of people that are requesting it. Um, the next question, you talked about quality of a type of wine. Please describe the difference between poor quality and good quality. Well, the, the very best quality in a wine, and, and, and again, it's, you know, quality is, is personal. There's a lot of things that make quality wine. I mean, sometimes if I'm out in California and one of my uh, Michigan friends brings out a bottle of Michigan wine and I don't know that, and I just stick my nose in it and it's like, oh my God, this is what Michigan smells like. It, it doesn't even matter if it's good or not. If it smells like Michigan and I'm homesick, it's really good, you know, <laughs> and uh, consequently, that's, I think, what people really define quality as, is does it have that sense of somewhere-ness, uh, you know, when you've had a vacation in Italy, and you get back here, and you go to the store and have a bottle of Italian wine, it's like, oh, uh, this is the summer in Tuscany, you know, it's, it's those types of memories, I think, that bring back uh, thoughts of quality, but I think more importantly, it, to me, a wine should grow on you. In other words, when you smell it, it should intrigue you, make you want to taste it. And when you taste it, you, 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 you know what it tastes like, but for some reason, there's so much there and it's so delicious, you can't remember it. You have to, you have to taste it again. There was one uh, Cote de Rhone one time that I brought in when I was a buyer at DNW. And I eventually went 
back to every store and bought every single bottle that we had in the entire company because I, I just was in love with the wine. Every time I would smell the wine and taste it, I was surprised. It was like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect that. And it wasn't the wine was changing. It was just that the wine had so much, um, so much interesting flavors that I wasn't that familiar with that every time I tasted it, it was a new experience. And uh, I ended up drinking through 16 cases altogether over a period of a few years. And every sip was a new adventure. I, I just absolutely loved that wine. <laughs> so that to me is quality. And, and I think also price. Uh, if, if you can't afford the wine, you can't enjoy it. So if you're, uh, you know, if, if you're buying a wine for 10 bucks and it tastes really good, it's really high quality because you can enjoy that $10 bottle of wine and you don't even think for one second what you paid for it. Whereas you open up a $150 bottle of wine and half the time you're drinking it, you're thinking, geez, I spent 150 bucks for this. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it kind of takes the fun out of it sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how long does wine last after the bottle is open and how should it be stored? stored? White wines, because white wines have a lot of acid in them, uh, will tend to store pretty good in the refrigerator for quite a while. The, the normal, pe normal people say three days to a week, I would say months. I've, I, I don't know that I've ever had a bottle of white wine spoil in the refrigerator. Red wines, generally my wife and I have usually two, three different red wines going at a time. So probably on average, we finish them after they've been open three days, maybe four. And uh, occasionally they taste a little tired when you get down to the last bit of the wine you opened four days ago. But I would say one to four days. And, and frequently the second day is the best day. Frequently the wine that sat overnight with a cork in it, of course, but with you know, a certain amount of headspace in it. Uh, you know, say you drank half the bottle and half of it sitting on the counter with a cork in it. I've often found the next day it's better than it was the, the night you opened it. It seems to, a lot of the different flavors just seem to build and release as the wine, uh, as the wine airs. And fortified wines, again, they say, you know, a week or so, but in my opinion, they last forever. I've had open bottles of port for a year and had no problem with them tasting just fine. Okay. And same with vermouth, you know, vermouth, uh, again, everybody says you got to keep it refrigerated and you shouldn't have it open for more than a week. But I don't know anybody that drinks enough martinis to go through a bottle of vermouth in a week. So <laughs> mine, mine generally takes a year to get to, to go to go through it. Uh, same person asked, how good is wild grape wine? Well, um, it, 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 the problem with wild grapes is they don't set much sugar. So to make a wine purely from wild grapes, I would say is just about impossible. I do make a wine, the uh, Michigan Vintner Green Label, which is about probably 10% wild grapes. And um, uh, normally the wild grapes don't get even close to ripe enough. Uh, in 2017, they did. And uh, they, I mean, they weren't ideal, but they were ripe enough to consider making wine out of. And so I blended it in with another wine and it's pretty darn good. I mean, it tastes grapey. I mean, it's just a matter of what you like. I mean, it has a, a very wild grapey, somewhat uh, vulgar, if you will, uh, flavor. But uh, you know, if you're, if you, you know, I mean, I, 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 I enjoy it. I, I think it's an interesting flavor. I think that's the one thing about hybrids in general that you have to um, kind of get out of your mind, things like Cabernet and Chardonnay. You have to realize that these are a different species of grape. So the wines that I make don't taste anything like the wines I'm, I, I'm showing here today. I'll show you, for example, this is the, this is the one I just spoke of. This is uh, the um, wine that's got wild grapes in it. And um, it's, I don't know, I like it. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it tastes good. Probably most people would say it tastes kind of nasty, but uh, I like it. <laughs> We had a few people kind of conversing with one another, just talking about, are there any serious wine collectors, meaning more than a few dozen bottles and some, there were some comments that we have about 150 bottles. If we find a wine we like, we buy a case, mostly French and mostly white. That kind of goes with what you were saying about quality and if you like something. Um, yeah, and I, and I would say if you drink much wine at all, buying multiple bottles is always a good idea. And especially if you're a curious person and want to see how long the wine lasts, 
you know, if it's if it's a moderately priced wine, I usually buy a case. If it's in a, if it's pretty expensive, maybe four bottles or six bottles, something like that. But typically, what I'll do is open a bottle. I, I think wine needs to settle. So if you've gotten it, you know, shipped in or you've driven to, you know, the store to buy it or whatever, it doesn't hurt to let it sit for a few days anyway, maybe a week or two. Anyway, I'll drink one bottle usually within a week or two after I buy it. Just an idea what I what I have. And then the other 11 bottles I'll set down in the wine cellar and probably open a bottle every six months or so. Just kind of watch how it absorb, uh, 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 how it develops. And when it gets to the uh, point where it's just really drinking good, we'll drink the rest of them and save one. And then we'll save the last one way beyond where we would think it would still be any good. And just for laughs, open it up. And sometimes it's glorious and sometimes it's spoiled. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the chance to take. <laughs> Yeah. Well, with um, kind of those comments, there's a little bit more conversation about using a vacuum pump. Wally said he, he's been able to um, maintain the integrity for up to six weeks, and somebody else commented that they felt like uh, using a simple vacuum pump is the best way to have wine last longer. Do you want to weigh in on vacuum pumps? I, I think they work. They, they definitely don't allow oxygen in, which is what spoils the wine. However, in my opinion, I think they suck the heart and soul out of the wine. Uh, so I don't use them. I, uh, <laughs> I guess it's just my opinion, but uh, they do, they will stop the wine from spoiling. Uh, they do a very good job of that. And so it depends on how much you know, head space you have. If you got a bottle of wine and it's like this full and you put the vacuum pump on it, um, you probably, I mean, you're only evacuating a, a, you know, a very, very small area. It'll probably keep just fine. and probably taste exactly as it did when you opened it for many, many days. Uh, by the same token, if it's two thirds empty and you put the vacuum pump on it, you've really evacuated a lot. And you've, in my opinion, sucked uh, everything that made the wine interesting out of it. <laughs> uh, I like to make a comment about vacuum pump because that's my answer. Oh, ah, okay. Uh, okay, the vacuum pump actually is removing the uh, air which is 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. You re remove the oxygen, you remove the oxidation potential. Yeah, exactly. So that's the purpose of doing that. So creating a vacuum is actually a good way to retard the spoilage. And I, I have done it for up to six, seven weeks and they still holding well, especially red wines. And probably for the average person that probably works very well. Uh, I guess I'm, most of my experience has been as a wine salesman where at the end of the day, wines that I had out for samples, I would pump them up and I would do that every day for maybe a week. And by the end of the week, there was, there was nothing left to them in, as far as flavor. Uh, I would say the average person drinks a bottle one day, half of it, pumps it up and then opens it and drinks the rest the next day or a month later or whatever. You probably haven't lost anything or very little because you've only pumped it up once. But if you were to take the same bottle and pump it seven, eight times, I think you'd literally suck everything out of it that made the wine interesting in the first well, place. Well, this bottle of wine is the Petit Sera uh, 2010. I opened it up about six weeks ago. I just oh, no put it in the glass. Wow. Okay? And it's still very good, just like it was but, fresh. And yeah, this but you said Petit Sera, it made me think of um, uh, a winery that we visited out in California when I talked about, you know, quality and a quality site. You know, we think of a site that's you know, high, hilly, um, good air drainage, good frost protection, etc. We were amazed when we went to the Bogle Winery. It's really hard to find. The first time we went there, yes. we got lost. But, but fortunately, the last time we were there, we had GPS in our car and we were able to find it. Um, it's, it's on an island, actually, in the Sacramento Delta. And um, it's, when we drove into the parking lot at the winery, I'm looking at the altimeter on the... Uh, uh, the, the Garvin, and it says minus 16. It's actually 16 feet below sea level. And, the, and that sounds crazy, but the thing is, is that during the uh, end of the, pre the previous, previous century, during the late 1800s, there was an enormous amount of Chinese labor in the San Francisco uh, area. And um, they had all these people that wanted work and were willing to do just about anything to get a paycheck. And so uh, they put all these people to work digging, making levees around these islands 
that were really just sort of like marsh islands in the Sacramento Delta. And they put these levees around them so that they would dry out and they could plant crops. Well, over the period of time, eventually these islands became holes in the water because they had like a sponge in the Delta, when the land dries out, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, the, the ground where they grow things is 16 feet, excuse me, 16 feet below the top of the Delta, which is at sea level. And so um, it's really crazy now as you drive around there, the, the levees are also the roads. So you're driving around in these little roads that are the levees. And then you get uh, to where the vineyards are, you're looking down the, on one side is water, you look down the other side is vineyards. It's really kind of a crazy thing. And in spite of that being what I would consider the absolute opposite place you would ever think of growing quality wine, um, in my opinion, Bogle may be the single most valuable wine out there in the market. Their wines are rarely over 10 bucks and they're always absolutely delicious. They always do make good. a very good Petit Syrah, yes. They do. Petit Syrah is one of their one of their hallmarks. And you can buy it anywhere. You can get it, you know, just you know, any grocery store, Myers, anywhere. And it's really, really good. And all of their wines are quite good, to be honest with you. Their Zin is really, really good as well. So we are at 2.30, but we have plenty of questions left in the chat. So are you willing to take a few more minutes and then I, let I, people... I, I have no time constraints, so anybody uh -huh. wants to... <laughs> well, I have somebody who would ask the same question twice. I think I overlooked it the first time. How many ounces are in a glass of wine? Normally, you would, you would consider five and a half to six. And so a bottle of wine is about 25 ounces. So you would get, you know, five, you know, okay glasses and four real nice full glasses. Uh, so when you go into a restaurant, typically a glass of wine is about five, six ounces. Um, and that would be from an alcohol standpoint, about the same as a 12 ounce can of mass market beer. Of course, if you're drinking micro brew, uh, some of the IPAs and so forth, uh, it could be much, the alcohol could be, alcohol could be much higher on the beer than that. And uh, it basically a, a shot of liquor, which would be about an ounce and three quarters, ounce and a half, would be about the same as a glass of wine. So kind of a glass of wine, a shot of liquor and a can of beer are all about the same. Although, like I said, uh, I, wines like uh, beers like IPAs tend to be a little higher, which does anybody want to know why they call uh, a beer that's not made in India, it's, was originated in Britain, why they call it India Pale Ale? Well, it's because same sort of story of why they shipped the wine to the outposts of the British uh, army. They also shipped beer. By the time it got there, it was generally spoiled. And so they started adding more hops, make the wine more bitter, and more alcohol to kind of even out the bitterness from the hops. So they shipped it to India in particular, uh, because it almost the beer almost never made it around the uh, Horn of Africa and, and or the Cape of Africa all the way to India through the Indian Ocean. It was always spoiled by the time it got there. And so the British, after uh, the, the soldiers had served a few years in the uh, army and they get back to England, well, the, the British beer tasted like water by comparison. And so they started making it in England for all the returning veterans and it became called India Pale Ale. And uh, they, we make like the Holland, uh, New Holland Brewery, they make a Mad Hatter, which is their India Pale Ale, and it's high alcohol and high, uh, high hops. <laughs> Good to know. Um, somebody's asking about decanting with a fast wine aerator like Venturi. Do you recommend that? I, I, I don't, there's nothing wrong with it. I think it does aerate the wine more quickly. But I generally like, to, if you've got a nice big, you know, glass, you know, this is probably a, I don't know, 16, 18 ounce glass. Uh, if you've got a, you know, a decent sized glass, just give it a couple nice swirls, it'll, it'll aerate it as well. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say the Venturi is wonderful and I, I just don't use it myself, but I, I do decant simply to get the wine off the sediment, not so much uh, to aerate it. In fact, if I'm going to open an older bottle of wine, uh, I've got a special place in the trunk of a car where I can set it so that it doesn't get jostled and I can actually open it when I get there. Because a lot of times I find with really old bottles of wine, sometimes they get better and better and better by the hour. And sometimes within two hours, they're as dead as a doornail. So you kind of 
with older bottles of wine, you, you kind of want to open it and at least taste it and then kind of enjoy it over a couple hours while it opens up and gets better, hopefully. <laughs> so um, I have a question. What is the future of box wines? Oh, I think it's a bright future. By the way, the, there is what we call bottle bouquet. And it has nothing to do with the cork of the bottle. It does, the, the bottle is glass. There's no flavor that's going to come out of the glass. And hopefully, if there's nothing wrong with the cork, there's no flavor that's going to come out of the cork. And, oh, by the way, the reason you get a corked wine, so-called cork wine, wine that's spoiled because it has a bad tasting cork, is that if you've ever been to an orchard and you bit into an apple and, and the orchard is not sprayed and there's bugs in the apples, you'll notice you bite into the apple and there's this little trail, this brown trail running through the apple. Well, it, hopefully you didn't eat the worm, but you probably ate what the worm left in the apple and uh, it may not taste so good. Well, the same thing happens with corks. You get little worms in the tree once in a while, and as it's burrowing its way in through the cork, it leaves a trail behind, which has got a really bad flavor and smell. And uh, one bad cork in a bag of a thousand will taint all of the corks to some degree. And so uh, that's the, one of the problems with corks is that they do get tainted. They've got um, uh, sensors now that they're using to sense that. It's called TCA, triclaranosol, uh, that, that they've got sensors now that can sense it. So you're not going to see too many bad corks these days, but it still happens once in a while. And certainly if you're opening wines from the 70s and 80s, I would say a third of them are, are spoiled and corked. Uh, the, the wine might be perfectly good, but it's got that real stinky kind of, uh, you know, bug excrement smell. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the glass shape significant? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we're talking about, I got sidetracked. Bag in a box. So you, you do develop bottle bouquet, though. And that just comes from the wine being in a bottle, just it being in that size of container. So when you taste a box wine, you're basically drinking wine right out of the barrel. So when you go to a winery and you say, geez, the wine tastes so good right out of the barrel, I would say you probably like box wine better than bottled wine because the box wine has no bottle bouquet, but it does have certain other flavors that develop in the barrel and seem to disappear when you put it in a bottle. Um, and there are a lot of quality box wines these days that uh, if you buy the three liter bag in a box that generally runs uh, 16 to 20 bucks, they're pretty darn good. Uh, they're in many cases the same wine that would be sold uh, uh, like Black Box when it first came out was Estancia. It was the same wine. And Estancia was 15 bucks and Black Box was $16 for a three liter jug, four bottles for a price of one, basically. Um, it's not Estancia anymore. It's basically the same wine as Blackstone, which is, I think, about 10 bucks a bottle. So still you're getting 40 bucks worth of wine for 16 or 18 bucks. So yeah, I think the, the ones that aren't quite as good are the ones that are in the five liter. Those are made from concentrates and that may not bother you. You may like wine made from concentrate just fine. The way they can make it so cheap and all these wines like two buck chuck and stuff like that. These wines are all made from concentrate and that makes it a lot cheaper to make wine because they just take great concentrate and they can ferment it in 10 days. They have a bottle of wine. They can go from concentrate to wine in 10 days, which makes the, you know, the time lapse much quicker. Plus they can make it year round. They're making it from frozen concentrate. They don't have just one you know, uh, week out of the year where they make wine for the whole year. They can make it you know, every day, 365 days a year. It makes the wines very, very inexpensive. However, the big difference is, is that um, up until Franzia's dark red, none of the red wines were made with the grape skins. They would simply hot press them so you get the color, but you'd get none of the flavor or texture. What, uh, again, there's such an abundance of Zinfandel and um, Petit Syrah that they started using Zinfandel and Petit Syrah skins to make their wine darker, and it also gave them good flavor. So they, you, there's actually a market for grape skins these days that some of the box makers are adding to their wine um, and so that it macerates just like a real wine. It takes a little longer. They can't do it in 10 days then. It might take, you know, three weeks, but it's still made pretty quickly and cheaply. And some of these are pretty decent. I would say generally the five liter ones, not so much, but the three liter bag in a box, I think are every bit as good as bottled wine. 
We are giving you a workout right now. That is okay. sure. so I think um, I don't think that you answered this. I think you went back to the box, but um, somebody's asking about the shape of the wine glass. Is it significant? It is. And um, I'm, I'm not such a big believer in all the different shapes like Riedel makes a wine, a glass for virtually every wine. And if you get a collection of them, you might have 40 or 50 different shapes, each for a different type of wine. I generally use two shapes. I use this shape for red wine and one that's smaller and a little bit more, um, uh, a little more elongated for white wine. And that's pretty much what I use, two, two different glasses. And I don't, I'm not sure why I use a smaller glass for white wine other than tradition, I guess. <laughs> okay, I think we've answered the how long does uh, wine keep after opening. What is a decent ice wine that you would recommend? Oh, well, the best in Michigan, in my opinion, is Chateau Grand Traverse, but they're really expensive. Um, Fen Valley makes one that's by no means cheap. I think it's about 20 bucks for a half bottle, maybe not even a quarter of a bottle. I mean, the Chateau Grand Traverse, I think, is $85 for a quarter bottle. So if you put that into perspective, that's like 300 and some dollars a bottle. That's pretty, pretty steep. But uh, Fen Valley makes wine that I think is just about as good, and it's a fraction of the price. I mean, it's still expensive. And in Canada, they make a lot of ice wine that is moderately priced, about the same price as the Fen Valley, and uh, quite good. But uh, yeah, in general, and then the German ice wines are all expensive. I don't think you're going to get anything much under 50 bucks for a half bottle or a quarter bottle. So it's, it's, price is a big factor in ice wine, but it's also expensive. Uh, somebody's asking about the Lodi region Zinfandels. This person thinks they're some of the best and would like you to comment on them. I agree completely. They're not only, I think, some of the very, very best in California, but that's one area where they've learned to do a little bit of mass production and um, their prices are not that bad. For 15 to 20 bucks, you can get stunning Lodi Zins. And for 10 to 15, you can get wines that you'll talk about for months. I mean, they're they really make good wines at a, at a very reasonable price. Uh, so I highly, highly recommend Lodi Zen. And that's, that would be a little further up the Sacramento from the area I was talking about where Bogle, Bogle does get a lot of their grapes from Lodi, but most of their own estate vineyards are the ones that are under sea level on the islands, the Delta Islands. But just a little bit further up the Delta would be where uh, Lodi is. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and send the outline out to the entire class in case you didn't receive it the first time. Just disregard it if you have already received it. And um, <laughs> Wally is suggesting that once uh, the pandemic is under better control that he needs to get together with David and Susan since they are <laughs> serious collectors. I like it. Has making connections. Um, without the oh, this is a, this is a good question. With all the fires out west, what are the effects they're having on the wine industry, and it, are there long term effects? Um, not so much long term for ninety nine percent of the wineries. It hasn't affected that many wineries, but of course. It's like COVID. If you're the one that gets it and dies, obviously it's a big deal. And it's the same with the uh, wineries out there. If you're if you're if you're one of the wineries that burned down and lost their vineyards, it's it's a it's a huge problem. But it it doesn't didn't affect that many wineries. The smoke, however, has affected a lot of wineries. There's been definitely going to be a lot of what they call smoke taint. However which will prevent a lot of these premium wineries from getting $30, $40 a bottle for their wine, that smoke taint. So what they do is they end up selling it to some mass producer who blends it in like 5% into their mass produced wine. And it actually makes the wine taste better. It gives it kind of an interesting little smoky note that's uh, complex and uh, cocoa-y and maybe a little bit of coffee and a little bit of dust. I mean, it just kind of adds some nice subtleties if it's, it's like spice, you know, I mean, people that don't like uh, um, tarragon say, you know, oh my God, if I can taste the tarragon, you got too much in it. Uh, some people would say it about thyme or rosemary or cilantro, but these are all flavors that some people like and some people don't. 
I'm pretty tolerant to smoke and oak, oak barrels. I kind of like the flavor of it. So a wine that has smoke tape probably wouldn't be a huge problem for me, but for a lot of people, it would be a clear flaw and they would not like it. And so uh, if they introduce it into wines in a very, very minute amount, it can actually be pleasant. The, the unfortunate thing is that if you're a winery that's paying and selling your grapes for $6,000 a ton, and somebody that's making wine for $8 a bottle buys it, they're only going to pay about $600 a ton for it. So you're going to take a huge loss on your crop, but it will get put into wine somewhere and drunk by somebody, <laughs> maybe into box wine. I don't know where it'll end up, but it'll, it'll end up somewhere into some low-priced wine and might, the low-priced wine might well be the better for it. Oh, and my answer to the Greek question, they didn't start bottling wine in Greece until 1953. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Up until then, it was all in barrels. So uh, uh, wood taste is not a, considered a flaw or a flavor. It's just part of the thing. Up until that time, they, a lot of times they used amphora and other pottery con, uh, containers that they actually put pine tar in to make them waterproof. And you ended up with wines that tasted like turpentine. And uh, as much of, you know, we would consider that a huge flaw. Uh, the Greeks actually uh, drank the stuff and thought it tasted pretty good. <laughs> um, I think we just have two more questions and we probably do need to wrap because I have a special interest group coming in at 3 p.m. Um, is the vineyard location more important to the length of, to the length of the growing season than the taste of the wine? So which is more important, the length of the growing season? They're inextricably, inextricably uh, connected. The length of the growing season will, inf will affect the taste and the quality of the wine. And uh, the one way you can mitigate that is with other varieties. Like I said, Merlot will ripen a little sooner than Cab. Uh, the early hybrids that I grow all ripen by the middle of September. Um, and by the end of September, early October, if we don't pick them, they'll, they'll be on the ground. I mean, they're just, they ripen very, very soon. Um, which is one of the reasons you would not say the Michigan Vintner wines are great wines by any means, but they're, uh, they are truly Ottawa County flavored. Uh, they, they definitely have the taste of the, uh, of, of the lo locale. Uh, by the same token, wines like these uh, wines from Columbia Crest and Chateau St. Michel, they have a very, very long, cool se season and dry. They can pick, be picking grapes pretty much almost into December. So you get a long, long hang, hang time. You get very flavorful wines. These are grapes that ripen very slowly and very late. And so, uh, you know, they might start picking in mid-September, but they probably won't finish, you know, depending on their site until very, very late in November. And uh, consequently, they make really good wine that way. But that's, that's site specific. You know, a site that um, allows you to hang your grapes until November is an ideal site. Uh, Fen Valley has one such site here locally. Their wines are totally different tasting than, than my wines because they're using different grape varieties and they're ripening them well into November, whereas mine are in the winery by the middle of September. Okay, I'm gonna give two more questions and we'll wrap by 2.50. Um, and this has just been awesome discussion. I have to say Thank this you. might be the longest class yet. <laughs> um, what should we know about the, uh, actually is red wine really healthier? I think that you hit on that medical curve, but is, is there something uh, about well, red wine specifically? Well, there's a few things. There's phenolics and resveratrol. Are, are two of the ingredients that are in red wine that are not found in white. So although white wine is good for you, certainly, the uh, red wine has basically components of the skin that, uh, that, that uh, seem to uh, be helpful for a, for a lot of things um, in, in that. And also one thing I just wanna mention very quickly, sulfites. People are concerned about sulfites. Sulfites for anybody that's in this seminar and is drinking wine are not a problem. If you are allergic to sulfites and you drank this wine, you would be dead right now. Uh, it's, it's completely toxic to people who have an allergy. If you didn't die from drinking a glass of wine, then you have no sulfite allergy. Um, and uh, it's normally not an issue with wine because wine is an acid and the mo molecules of the sulfite bound, bind to the acid. And so they're bound, they're not vaporous. And uh, sulfite is actually a, a 
a poison to some people that have severe asthma. It's actually a poison to their lungs. And where it, why it has a warning on the bottle and why it's considered an evil substance is from salads. With most um, water that the salads are washed from is alkali, it's basic. And so you get the sulfite and you spray it on a salad bar and it becomes very volatile and can kill people. And so uh, they quit using it in salad bars and they made wineries put a warning on there because they, it is toxic, but not in wine and not for like 99.9% .9 of people. If you've ever drank in wine and didn't die, then you don't have a sulfide allergy. Because there's, there's sulfide in the wine naturally, just during fermentation. If you didn't add any, you'd have sulfide in it, but they add a little extra to preserve the color. It does keep the color of the wine from browning. Uh, particularly with white wines, we generally have a little more sulfite than red wines. Because if the red wine browns a little, it's not going to look so bad. But if uh, white wine browns, it looks spoiled, even if it tastes fine. Um, actually, let me give one more. And it's about the wine list that you sent out. And then I just have a cut comment that somebody said a wonderful informative class. And I think we can all agree on that. But uh, Tom would like to know, should we, what, what should we know about the last wines on your list? The Cab and Merlot, it was a Columbia Crest Cab versus a Columbia Crest Merlot. I think all I would say is that two different grape varieties and um, grown identically with the same quality. And I think you can see that they're both of the same quality. And if anything, you might like the Merlot better. Um, concerning Columbia Crest, just a slight, or the H3, it's just a different uh, different locale. So again, you've got the same wine, uh, again, a high quality single vineyard Merlot, but from a very specific part of the Columbia Valley that has a special flavor and sort of defining quality, that sense of somewhereness or that specificness is what drives up quality. In Burgundy, they rate the wines by Premier Cru and Grand Cru, Grand Cru, a great growth, is a much more specific, um, high quality region than the Premier Cru, which is more high quality, more specific than the wine of the village. Now, it doesn't mean that the Grand Cru is actually a better wine than the, than the village wine or the Premier Cru. It's just more distinct. I mean, it has its own identity. It is unique. Whereas the wine from the village or from the, um, the Premier Cru might taste like other wines from the same area, and the village wine might taste like any wine made from Pinot Noir in that, in that vicinity. It wouldn't have its own identity, but it wouldn't necessarily be lower quality. And, uh, and so that's sort of the, the difference between the Hort's Heaven Hills and the uh, Sats of St. Michel Columbia Valley Merlot. Columbia Valley is a big area, a lot of different grapes, uh, not specific. I mean, it tastes like wine from the Pacific Northwest, whereas the Hort's Heaven Hills positively tastes like wine from Hort's Heaven Hills. It has a, its own unique identity. And that's what drives up price and what a lot of people are willing to pay for quality. They have a certain flavor. And I think with everybody, it's different. I've tasted wines that where I've had flavors that I've never experienced. I had a bottle of Charles Krug um, Merlot, and there was actually flavors that I'd never experienced in any fruit and any food I'd ever had or any wine I'd ever had. And it was just fascinating to just sip that wine and sip it and sip it and just expose myself to a whole new set of flavors. Mm. Well, it is so fun to hear you talk so passionately about this. Um, obviously very knowledgeable. We do appreciate everything. Um, I just wanna tell everybody who's on this call right now, I'm actually not going to close the class because I already have somebody in the waiting room for the next class. And I'm afraid I might break the universe if I, if I close it out. So just unless you're part of the Gardner's group, we shall say goodbye. Thank you so much, Brian Kane. Thank, Thank you, Teresa Thank you. Ellis, for coordinating. This was fascinating and wonderful. And I will um, forward the outline that you provided uh, once again to the whole class. Um, and if you don't have it, then you won't. Okay. <laughs> I, I can, in fact, I can resend it to uh, the, to you again. That would that would be great. Did you send it to the class, or I did sent it to Kim? If uh, if you could, real quick. Just it's just my uh, last name Timmer at yeah, hope dot edu. Okay. You can send it to me, and then I'll just I have the course list, and I'll get it out to everybody right away. 
Okay, we'll do. Thanks. Awesome. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a great uh, afternoon to everyone. Yay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Hi, Mary Voss. You're in the right place. This is we are uh, we're just closing we just had a wonderful class on uh on wine and we had there were so many questions that we ran over so i'm not going to close uh -huh. i'm not going to close the class i'm just going to leave it open and let people excuse themselves unless they just become very interested in gardening all, all suddenly <laughs> that would be nice too yeah that looked good to me that class i thought oh i should have signed up for that I probably would have let you in. It was, it's actually very, very interesting content. I wonder how many people are joining this afternoon. Do you know? Um, you know, I don't. Um, yeah. Trying to see who might be on mic right now. Um, let me check. Probably be Susan for sure, but yeah, I'm just trying to pull up one of those emails. I think that oh, it felt like there were maybe how 20 people in that original email. Not th not that everybody will be able to attend, but it seems like a fairly sizable group. Oh yeah, let's see. Uh, one, two, three, four. I'm going to say there's roughly 20 people on the email. So, you know, maybe 10 or so. Mm -hmm. We have Terry Holden. Hi, Terry. Hi, Terry. Hi, Judy. And we have Ruth Lindholm. And I don't know if she is from Gardeners or from the other class. Oh, she's off. Okay. I was going to say sometimes people walk away and they don't realize they're still logged in. And I just realized I'm not consequential to your meeting, um, except to let people in. So you just let me know when you want to begin and or if you want to start, I'll just keep letting people in. So Terry, did you, you're not going in for classes at all. You're not going into the nursing. Uh, no, I'm not. actually, we had our last class uh, the previous Thursday. So we're done for the part that I participate in and all the tests are going to be online. So for the skills lab, we're essentially done. We gave our test a week. Uh, a little bit earlier, that way the students get freed up to take the rest of the test. So, no, nope, we're done for this year. So, that's it. It was a different actually world out there. Yeah. Yes, it is. I was on campus today to pick up some clothing that I bought from the Student Nurse Association, always have an apparel sale. And it, it's just so odd. There's just simply no one in the building at all. Last week, I left them a little tray of candy, and within one day, that candy would be gone. And I still see there's about 10 pieces left. So that tells you that we don't have a big group coming into the, into the college. So yeah, it's done. 
I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, how do I get everybody's picture to come up? Go up to the upper. Go ahead. Are you on your iPad or? On no, your I'm on computer? a computer. I'm on a computer. Oh, I'm showing upper, up in the corner. And upper right, talks. In, upper okay, right hand corner of the black part of the Zoom screen. Uh huh. Corner, it'll say either speaker view or gallery view. Just click back and forth on that. Um, I don't see that at all. Okay. Um, I've got little like squares, three little squares, like a little dash, a bigger square, and a great big square above my picture. Do what? Wait. I have, should I press that big square? Um, I want you to find somewhere on your desktop, probably in your uh -huh. toolbar, a blue circle that has a white video camera in it. And if you can find that and click on it, it might expand your Zoom screen. Sometimes we minimize our Zoom screen accidentally. Try. I don't see that at all. Okay. Um, do you see any toolbar at the bottom of your At screen? the bottom, I see mute, stop video, participants, share screen, chat more. Okay. And if you, if you look up on that screen to the uh -huh. far right-hand side, uh -huh. is there anything in the upper right-hand corner <laughs> that you there's can click a, on? There's just squares. Um, I don't click see anything. Click on that. The larger Please. square? Yeah. Okay. I just did that. Nothing. Um, I'm larger. Are you? Okay. Um, On the right to that, it says participants. Find a participant. Um, past, future, classroom, um, and just list some people's names. And hmm. I mean, it's for sure a view issue. Um, are you sure that you have, um, in a sense, like a silly question? But do you're sure you have a touch screen when you're touching the screen? It's changing something because if oh not, yeah, definitely. Okay. I know, because I go back and forth between devices. And sometimes it's not. Okay. Um, I'm kind of at a loss. I wish, if you want to share your Well, that's okay. If I can't I see everybody, when they talk, I'll see them. That's all I can do. So I just, before, when I've done Zoom, I've had everybody's picture pop up. Mm -hmm. It should be that it way. Says, yeah, Terry? Susan, in the bottom, underneath where it says chat, when I go on, I always click the little camera that says join with video. Then I get everyone's pictures. Is mm -hmm. that something? Is not you know at the very bottom where you have your PowerPoint yeah. and Word. I always I have to click that little camera that says join with video. Then all my pictures come on the top. I the I did click that you and did? then I just okay. Just mean. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm gonna say that's usually to indicate that you yourself are gonna transmit your video out. Okay. Okay. A Susan. little bit different than. And, uh, but that's a good, I mean, you're troubleshooting. That's what counts. I just. It says um, invite mute on the right in a white. It's all white on that side. Okay. Zoom group chat. Should I click that? Zoom group chat, maybe? Sure. There's a little um, arrow. Okay, that just gives me all the people that are in it. That doesn't connect me to any of them to see them. Raise hand, yes, no, go slower, go faster, more. Invite yeah. mute. It really is. It's a, it's definitely a view issue, meaning the view that your camera or that your Zoom is in is limiting the number of participants that you're seeing. And the only way that I know how to fix that in all the times I've taught classes is that um, the option in the upper right hand corner that has the squares with the circles, clicking There's on- There's a little tiny little square I'll just click this thing. I don't know what it is. Yeah, click it. It didn't do anything. It took me. Uh, that didn't do anything. Mm, boy, I wish I could help you. Um, oh, now I see the little blue camera at the top has virtual classroom. That's not going to help me, though, right? No, but if. Um... It's really strange because before I've done it and I've had everybody on. I don't know. Hmm. Is everybody else seeing everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yes, I'm I seeing will, everyone on the top. 
Judy, I'd love to help you after this meeting. If you want me to okay. do it now, I can troubleshoot for one more minute with you if everybody's okay. If everybody wants to start the meeting, that's okay. I'll just I'll just see each person when they talk. That's all. Well, I mean, I won't see everybody. It's all right. Can you click gallery? Yeah. Gallery. I don't see gallery. Up at my computer, up at the top on the right, it says view. I click on view and then I see three things, speaker, gallery, and full screen. And I don't have that. You don't have that. Okay. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. I, I don't know. I, I don't see anything. I'm gonna do one more troubleshooting. Go to the very top of your computer screen. It, uh -huh. it, you should have a toolbar that says Zoom US and then says meeting, view, edit, window, help. If you click on view. Okay. Got I, I, don't, I, I don't know if that'll change something. I don't even see that. Okay. Thanks. Well, that's all right. Uh, that's okay. I can see each person when they talk. Judy, let's hook up after. Let's get you. Let, okay. I'll, I'll troubleshoot it with you. I'm going to go okay. off camera and on mute if you need me. Let me know. Okay. We don't have Susan. Do we have pictures? I don't have a picture from anybody. Can anybody hear me? Yes. yes. We can hear you. Oh, I can, can hear you. you. Okay. Because I, I, do we have a picture? We I have you on the full screen, Susan. Okay. Okay. That's fine. And then you're I, at the top too when you're not talking. So, we okay. Because I have, yeah. I had everything black for a minute and I didn't have any pictures of anybody. And I thought, oh dear, we've just lost. <laughs> Let's no. see. The black squirrel is on my bird feeder. Oh, they're okay. good. Okay. Well. Yeah. Um, I noticed there are a few people that are still on, on mute. Yeah. So if you can figure out how to get yourselves off of mute, this is supposed to be a discussion. <laughs> so Mary and Sarah, if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, there should be a little mi picture of a microphone on the far left-hand side. And right now it has a red slash through it, Sarah. And if you click on that microphone, the microphone... Yes, there you go. Good job. Mine was on my picture at the top. Mm -hmm. Who is it, Jody? Oh, I'll talk to her just briefly. Karen, I want to know how you got that picture behind you. Uh huh. What? Who? You've got a picture, picture behind you of the, the poppies. The poppies. The oh, you go into the view and then you can um, somewhere, you can go into there and you can choose virtual and then you can upload a picture that you can get. Okay. That is just, this is gorgeous. Mm. That's the one in uh, Fenville. Yep. Yeah, super. Anyway, that is another season that I'm looking forward to. <laughs> <laughs> aren't we all <laughs> I, I have planted 850 bulbs looking oh, forward to spring wow. wow and i have i have 10 more coming because when i got my package that was supposed to have 20 in it i had 10 bulbs and some kids christmas pajamas <laughs> uh, apparently my package had gotten opened up and somebody else's package had gotten opened up and they switched content so anyway I called Brex and they are wonderful to work with and they're sending me 10 more so we'll see anyway um we're going to talk about what did you plant what, what did, did you plant? plant um well I planted 120 daffodils I have a lot of daffodils but I always plant more I planted uh, 120 tete -a -tete oh. daffodils because they're the little ones. And then I planted probably a hundred and some um, winter aconites. If you're not familiar with winter aconites, mm -hmm. they are a, a Michigan wildflower. They're a teeny tiny little bulb. They get a little bright yellow five petal flower. They're only, you know, inches high and um, they bloom in March. They're one of the very oh, wow. first things to come up and bloom and they, they do naturalize. If you don't disturb them, they actually go to seed and they will 
they will increase. So then I, mm. I planted some other little blue flowers that'll bloom in the spring and I planted some grape hyacinths. I, I, I was, I was oh. done planning. It took me forever to plant the first, you know, 740 bulbs. Uh -huh. that, was, that was my order. And I went to, um, went to Aldi's one day for something and I found a package on, on the shelf of the mixed blue grape hyacinths. 40 bulbs for five bucks. And I thought, oh, this is a deal. So I bought them and planted them. And then I went to um, Myers like the next week and I found the extra bulbs that were still there. And I got 50 just blue gray hyacinths for $3. Wow. So oh, wow. I thought I got a real deal there. So I put those in. And then Brex has pink gray hyacinths. And I've always wanted them and have always refused to spend the money for them because they are $60 for 10 bulbs. Wow. And I said, you know, I'm crazy, but I'm not that crazy. So I didn't order them. And yet they had this, you know, crazy sale. They, they're trying to clear everything out. And they had them 10 bulbs for 20 bucks. And I said, all right. I can do this. So I have 10 of them in the ground now. I got 10 more to come and then I'm done. <laughs> so this is um, 2020. I want to put behind me and look forward to 2021 in the spring. And maybe we can actually get together in 2021 in the spring. I think that'd be great. Uh, but in the meantime, we have Christmas pots that need to be planted. And uh, I'm... Uh, I got started. I sent you all some pictures and I have my pictures up on my phone. I don't know how to bring them up on this um, or I would. Yeah, you can do it. We'll get back to one. See if I've got, would this work? I don't know if this will work. Oh, there. That's Terry's pot right there. <laughs> of all pots to show. <laughs> it's the very first one and it was the first one on my list. And I love your pot, I think it's beautiful. Um, Terry tells me this was a bunch of leftovers put together on a very cold day. Terry, you want to talk about it? <laughs> yes, that's uh, the stems from my astilbe, and then some of my conifers, and then I have my holly bush, and I just, I don't know anything about arranging a pot, but that pot that it's in is a cement pot that I've had for years, and it's too heavy to move. So I just got my clippers and started chopping everything and threw it in there without any looks, design so <laughs> it was it was kind of fun i think it looks great and i love the idea of using the dry to still be in there that's really pretty yeah that does well i don't cut mine back i let it go for winter interest and then i cut it back in the spring or the yeah early spring. in the spring right 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 yeah well i'm going to have to check mine out next year and kind of save some because the I had a new set of landscapers come this year to deal with the leaves and boy did mm -hmm. they clean out my beds it looks great, but it looks so bare. I can't believe you can't see the dirt in the summertime. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me see what else do we have here. Next pot. Oh, I went to Yonkers on Tuesday. Yonkers is having their open house and um, their open house goes through the 21st and they've got all kinds of greens and all kinds of sticks and pine cones and things to put in pots. And so I just took my camera out, took a few pictures I thought we could share. Um, this one is white twigs and different kinds of pine and red berries and some pine cones. Um, just a very simple arrangement, you can see it there. Uh, but very pretty. I think, you know, one of the things that's important when you're putting a pot together is, first of all, you have to look at the, the height of your pot and, and get something that's proportional and then you have to look at your different greens. I like different shades of green, different textures of green. That's where the, the different conifers, the pines, the hollies, anything that's gonna stay green for the season, um, when you put it in your pot, um, it gives you some texture. And this, is, this one's a really good example of different textures of green, if you can see there. And then the, the, the white branches, and of course the red berries are really pretty. And they have, of course, all of this for sale. Um, this one. Can I ask a question? 
Sure. When you do your pots in the winter, do you actually put the dirt in or do you just cut the greens and stuff them in? I, I mean, I, I put I, out Tuesday morning and I, because the squirrel is now invading my feeder and he's out there right now. Um, I just simply cut everything off the pot so I wouldn't disturb the dirt too much. And, you know, the root balls are there. With, okay. They're not, they're not heavy root balls and the, the dirt is wet. And then I just cut off the pine and cut off whatever I was going to stick in there. And I stuck it in with the dirt. Okay. And, and, just, so you do and, do and, I, and I just left the dirt. The one thing I will caution you because I got caught with this one year. Um, I did my pot and it was all very beautiful. And I put some artificial red poinsettias in it to give it some color. Okay. I had to live with those poinsettias until the dirt thawed out in probably March or April. So. Yeah, that's what, that's why I wondered if you use the dirt as it freezes and you can't change yeah. it or anything. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, okay. That's, that's the one thing you really have to be cognizant of if you're going to put some artificial thing or anything you put in there. You're going to have to be remember you're going to live with this if you're using okay. the dirt because or anything that's going to freeze. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, this one I think is a lot of fun because they have the, the stems with the cotton mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I, I like that. I think that it gives it some white. It looks Christmassy with the different color. It has some, some silver types of, um, branches, the artificial branches in that one. Fakes are great, um, because they don't fade. And uh, there are there are some silvery branches in here that are genuine fakes. So that's kind of cool. How would the cotton hold up, Susan? No, I haven't used cotton. Um, I I don't know. I would think it would last for a while. Uh, it depends if you have critters that might like to use it. <laughs> I got <have> critters. <laughs> I have critters. <laughs> I expect by the time I get up this call, my bird feeder will be empty. Mm. And I've done everything to keep this squirrel off of here. Um, this one has the, the birch poles. Would you hold it back just a few more inches? How's that? Um, yeah. <laughs> Six of one half dozen the other. Yeah, it has the, the birch poles and it has some red Christmas ornaments and a big, a big bow uh, and the different kinds of pine. Yeah, Mary's got it. There. So that's been, good. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. Yeah, that's a that one's fun. Um, the next one has the birch poles too, and if you can see, and maybe you'll have to go back and look at my email over here in the corner. There's a little pair of skis. They're oh. really cute. Oh. And then the the pine cones have been painted white. So that's, that's a fun thing to do. Um, oh, yeah. this, this, one was on, this one was on the floor. So it would be um, a different, it's a, like a log for a pot. That is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. and, and it's got the, the, uh, the buffalo plaid is really in this share. If you look at stuff, there's buffalo plaid and the old ceramic Christmas trees with the lights that we had 30 years ago, they're everywhere. Now that's, that seems to be the trends for this year. Let me see, that one's got some beautiful, yeah, come on. What's next here? Whoops, photos. Ah, this one is mine. I like this that. Is this Pretty. is just, you know, it's it's a frame that you would normally put a, a, a climbing plant on. Mm -hmm. And I have a rope of, you know, the plastic rope that has the, the lights in it. And they're warm lights. I got those at um, Menards a couple of years ago, and they're still going. And then I have a string <clears throat> of white Christmas lights. And the Christmas lights are the cool tone. So I have both the warm and the cool. <clears throat> this is on my front porch. Um, there is a plastic pot that is full of dirt inside my blue ceramic pot. It sits on the very top step of the porch, so it doesn't get a lot of weather. Nothing wants to grow in that pot. 
and I have it on a timer and it goes on, you know, I'm constantly changing the timer. It goes on just before dark, goes off at midnight, goes on about 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, goes off about 8.30 right now in the morning. And it's, we have no street lights on our street. So this is my night light because my, my front doors are glass. And it's just, it's kind of a fun thing. I always put another big flower pot on the, the next step down in the summer, maybe a second pot on the next step down with, um, with plants in it. So it kind of covers the fact that this is ugly looking. Um, the, uh, the cord that attaches to the, the extension cord that goes to the plug where the timer is, I have some bird nests that I've collected. Um, the, the robin's nest has lasted the longest. The Phoebe nest kind of fell apart, uh, but they're just different kinds of nests, but it, it kind of covers up the ugly cord and the connection. Um, sometimes I'll try and get some ground cover or some Johnny jump ups or something to grow in the spring. They, they don't do particularly well, but I try. Uh, but as soon as I get around to it, I will stick some greens in this for, for, uh, for winter. And it looks really pretty in the winter when I get the greens on. Uh, I wouldn't probably have ordinarily done my flower pot on the deck this week, except the squirrel was into everything. And I knew we had this call, so I thought I'd just go ahead and do it. But I haven't done this one yet. I will. Uh, and then I have a bow that's um, like it's gold and burgundy, big bow that matches the bow on my wreath that I put on the door. And nobody's going to see it anyway because I'm at the end of the cul-de-sac and you don't really see my house all that well from the street, but I enjoy it and that's all that matters. Right. But this is fun. This is, this is just, it's a, it's a, well, whoops, it's just a fun thing to have on the front porch because I have light when I need it. There aren't any lights on in the house and I'm amazed how long that rope of light of lights have, have lasted. The Christmas lights I've had to replace, you know, maybe every 18 to 24 months, which is really good. And, you know, if I wanted, I could add a, a string of colored lights on that for, for the holidays. But that's, that's just fun. I, I just thought I'd share that one because it's, it's something a little bit different. I like it. I'm going to copy it from my deck. I have something, our dining yeah. table is right by the glass looking out at Lake Mac and that will be really pretty. It's so, fun. Yeah, it's a nice idea. Yeah, thank you. This is the pot that's on my deck. And this is the one that I did um, on Tuesday. Beautiful. And I went out and I just cut back some of my white pine because these white pine trees are going a little crazy. And then I have, um, can't really see it here too well, but I have some chartreuse colored evergreen that's, a, I think it's a juniper mm -hmm. that's out on, on the cul-de-sac. And then um, I have those little gold, well, little rusty stars that I've had forever that I bought at a garden store years and years and years ago. And they're always in a flower pot, always outside every year. Um, and then I had a, a couple of pine cones that were on a stick from a, an old flower arrangement. I stuffed them in. But the really fun thing this year is this. Yeah. It was such a good idea. This is um, my alium, and I planted them, planted, I don't know how many bulbs, not that many bulbs, a few years ago, and they never, I mean, they come up and they bloom, and they never do great, but there they are. This year, I had 30 flowers. I wow. could not believe it. So I, as soon as everything kind of dried, I clipped them back and brought them in put them downstairs in the storage area and they've just been sitting in a vase down there waiting. And I got out my handy dandy can of paint, gold paint. <laughs> and I sprayed them with gold paint because I think it will help keep them together a little bit better. Um, and it gives the, the flower pot a little bit of a sparkle. And I think it'll hold them together a little bit better in the weather. I don't know how they're going to hold up, but right now, they look great and I have a bunch more that I can use in the house. I will probably um, you know, like snap this off so it's a shorter stem and stuff them in my Christmas tree. I've done that with dried hydrangeas before and they look great. Uh, it makes a real mess when you pull your tree apart but they really look great when they're on there. But I thought this was a fun thing to do. And then if you don't have pine cones on a stick, 
there aren't a lot of pine cones this year I've noticed. Last year I had a super abundance of pine cones and acorns. I couldn't even see my driveway for the acorns. Um, this year I don't have very many, but I have found some when I've been out with my walks with the dog. And I got some doll wood at Michael's and I got out my hot glue gun and there they are. I did a whole bunch of them, oh, just great. glued them on. Hmm. Um, I'm thinking maybe I wanna get some brown paint or some green paint to paint this if it's gonna show. Um, but it works really well. And I, I picked up some other pine cones when I was out um, just an hour or so ago. You can see the end of the pine cone has this little piece on the bottom here. I would cut that off before I tried to stick a stick on the bottom of it because this, this is awkward. This won't work so well. But if you can get it a little more flush with the bottom of the pine cone, it works. This is a bamboo skewer that you would use to make a kebab. It works just as well as the doll wood. So if you have these in your drawer, go for it. Works great. Um, you can take wire and you can take that flexible wire and tuck it in and wrap it around inside the leaves and then mm -hmm. have the wire come out and you can cut the wire into something. That works. I don't know if that makes sense, not what I'm saying, but. Yeah, well, I have, I have some. Jingle I've done that here. before. I have some yeah. jingle bells. They were on uh, another piece that I bought and I didn't want them exposed, you know, so directly to the weather because I just put it on my mailbox. So I took them off and that's that's what they did. They just, they're on wire and then they're on a, a pick. Yeah. And I have two of these ones in a, a flower arrangement right now. So that works really well. But just, you know, some fun ideas to to go with, I'm gonna have to, with, with my pot. And then the bow, it's just indoor, outdoor. It's outdoor uh, weatherproof type ribbon that I've had for years. And I just, you know, pull it out put it in the basement and I'll pull it out next year. I'll put it back in my pot. <laughs> so if it gets a little damaged, it doesn't show it's on my deck. It doesn't matter. The other thing, um, if you pull up the picture and look at it closely, I have some curly willow in here. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with these pieces of curly willow, but I have used curly willow in the spring. I will often repot, replant this pot when I pull the Christmas stuff out. I'll go to Yonkers and I'll get some pansies or something. I can't put pansies in the ground because the critters eat them all. But if I put them in a big pot that's up a little higher, they don't seem to get them. And I'll put the curly willow in the middle and then it roots. And then I have another tree if I want it. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Uh, but my original curly willow tree came from a flower arrangement um, in 2006. That original tree is in Stevensville. And when we moved here from Stevensville, I brought a piece of it with me. So it just, it's very hardy. It's fun, but it is very hardy. Um, Susan, yeah? Susan, when you uh, put the uh, plantings in and through the dirt, do you, because of the, you know, the conifers can really dry out with the winter weather and the wind. Do you ever water them? Um, I watered them in so that they would, you know, would be, the ground would be a little yeah. more solid when right. I get done. Right. Mm -hmm. What I have done is I always get this spray from Hunt Tree every fall. And it comes in a little container about the size of a 35 millimeter plastic container when you get 35 millimeter film. I mean, mm -hmm. that's all it is. And you mix it with a gallon of water. And then you put in a spray bottle and you spray your rhododendrons with it because they... They, they will take a real beating in our wind sometimes and the, the leaves of the rhododendron will dry out and it will hurt your rhododendron. And I usually, not always, but I usually get them sprayed. This year I got them sprayed and I had hmm. pr most of that spray. I had a good bit of it left actually. Well, so I, I, sprayed, I sprayed my conifers and I will probably, because it's so warm today, I'll probably give them another good spray here in another couple of days and that helps keep them from drying out completely uh, it's just kind of a nice thing to help them get through a longer piece of the winter because winter is very gray around here and I want some color I agree and I, I when I was at Yonkers today and yesterday it was kind of fun watching them put the pots together but they had this spray um, called wilt something or other. It's probably is that first. similar to yeah, what very you? Similar. So yeah. that's not a bad thing to have then to no, spray it, some it's here. A, it's a very good right. thing to have on hand, and if you get okay. a, if you get a wreath, you know, a, yes. a live wreath, spray it on your wreath. Spray it on your wreath. 
Oh, um, good. Okay. Um, you, can, you can spray the wreath with water and mist it all the time, but if you put some of that wilt proof on, it does help. So it's it. a good thing. Thank it's you. Very, Thank yeah, you. It's, a, it's a very good thing to do. Bye. And Thank then you. Mary Voss sent me this picture. That's um, beautiful. Mary, you took this in downtown Holland? Right. Probably last year or the year before. Yeah, I think this one is fun because of the proportions. You've got a, a very tall base and then you've got the tall um, birch um, logs there. It's, I, it, I love the proportions on it. And I, I think the white, are they um, like seed pods? Can you tell? Oh, I couldn't really tell. I mean, I know you can use things like um, different seed pods. I don't know. I can't pull it up. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's that one. That one's really the, the base on that one. The, the pot that it's in is so really is really pretty, and then the proportion because you've got the 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 birch oh, logs and you've got some red twigs. Yes, logs they are. Pardon? They are. They are pods. They are pods. pods. Yeah. yeah. And this one's got three or four different kinds of evergreen in it. Um, so again, mm -hmm. you've got different textures, different colors. Of, of the greenery and I, that really gives it some interest. I mean, it's, it's almost like planting your garden. You want different colors, different textures to, to give it some, some interest and that's fun. Um, this they, they, uh, they I all have- about, What I liked about this one was the red stem dogwood. Yep. Can you see that? Yep, the red twig dogwood is so pretty. That one gives it color. Um, I love red berries in my stuff. I like the artificial ones because they don't dry up and fall off. Um, sometimes they will weather through a couple seasons. Sometimes they won't. Um, but I got these at Michael's the other day. They were $1.99 a stem and they were 40% off. So if they oh, last wow. me a season or two or three, um, so much the better and it's cheaper than the real ones and i don't i have a few mm -hmm. i have a few real ones on a bush out front i don't want to cut them off because i want to leave them there because i want the color in the garden so mm -hmm. i will use the artificial ones and then they also have the short stems so i have those in a flower arrangement right now and i used i should have brought it with me i used um the, my leftovers of my my pot and I, I did a little flower arrangement and I put some of these in it and then um thought I'd talk about that a little bit. I have another bowl that looks just like this that I put my flower arrangement in. Probably another can, one too. You can see it, it's an ice cream bowl. Cool. Cool. You know, I would love to fill it up with ice cream and eat that much ice cream, but then I wouldn't be able to eat for the rest of the day. Um, and then you just use your oasis for water. And sometimes you have to tape those down, maybe a little bit of masking tape or some specialty tape, tape it down so it doesn't, it doesn't float. The other thing I really got into this year, so I wanna share it with you, Flora Life. Um, it's called Flora Life Crystal Clear. You get the little packets when you get your flowers at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. I went on Amazon and I bought this whole big container uh, let me see, it's 10 ounces. I don't remember what I paid for it. You use a quarter of a cup and a gallon of water. So I have to use a funnel to get it, you know, measure out your quarter of a cup, use a funnel, put it in your, your gallon jug and then fill it up with water. And then I just keep it here. I'm in my laundry room right now. I'll keep it in the laundry room or wherever. Uh, and whenever you use fresh flowers, use this. I have clipped roses from my garden and kept them two weeks in this stuff. Mm. So I, I did my flower arrangement and used this with the pine. So I'm curious to see how long it's going to last, but it has just, I think it's wonderful stuff. So I wanted to share it with everybody because it works. So what else does anybody have? I've got pine, holly, oh, sumac. Um, we have all kinds of sumac trees along our street here. And if you can get the, the sumac flower at the top so that they're straight, very often they, they curve. So they're kind of hard to get in a, in a pot. But I have, 
you know, if you can find some that are straighter, even if they're curved, sometimes they're fine, depending on how you get them in the pot. They look really nice in a pot and they last most of the season without any problem. Curly willow, my alium, the white birch, red berries, wed twig dogwood, um, terries a still be different seed pods. Um, spray paint, red, gold, silver, whatever you like. Mm -hmm. uh, one year I did my pot, I was, I was just kind of in a different mood that year. I wasn't into red and green so much. And I had this fun ribbon, uh, it was a wired, wired ribbon and it was wide. And it was a white ribbon and the decorations on it were turquoise, shocking pink and <laughs> chartreuse green. And it was fun all winter long because it wasn't particularly Christmas. And the ribbon lasted all season. It was just ribbon you would use on package. It wasn't anything special, um, but it did have the wire in it. So it, 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 it looked great. So, <laughs> I mean, you don't, you can have a different theme. It doesn't necessarily have to be Christmas um, or, or, or red and green specific. Um, so if you want to tie your pot to the, to the decorations in the house, sometimes you can get away with using some of the same things. Silk flowers sometimes do great. Um, if you have garden ornaments, you know, different ornaments in your, in your garden during the summer, you may want to figure out how to put them in your flower pot. If that's something that you think would work. My stars come from my Christmas flower pot. Um, mm -hmm. the, the one with the, the lights on, I have a pink stained glass angel. And I also have a green one just like that, that I bought at craft show probably 15 years ago. And they are outside most of the year. Um, the pink one will stay. I, I did bring the green one in because she didn't seem to fit in my pot on the deck, but the pink one's still out front. Um, so anything that's in your garden right now, you might want to consider putting in your flower pot, depending on the size of your flower pot. When yeah. I was at Yonkers today, too, they have really nice pot stickers that are stainless steel. Oh, uh, they're a little pricey, like $12. <laughs> But they had a great star and a reindeer, and I think there was an angel. But I'm going to enjoy using those because I think one thing is they, they probably will last being stainless steel. But stainless they were very steel. shiny. They really looked nice in the pot. So I was going to try that. You know, the other thing I, I thought about, and I didn't think about it early enough to, to, you know, really check it out. But sometimes if you go to the craft stores, mm -hmm. um, they have pre-cut pieces, thin pieces of wood that in different shapes and they may have like star shapes and angel shapes and that kind of stuff for the holidays that, you know, kids could paint. Whereas you could take that and, you know, use your stick and glue it onto your stick and spray paint it. And that would work. And that would be a little cheaper, but the stainless, the stainless is the shiny one, but you can use, you know, your gold spray paint that works. Um, the other thing I thought about was I also have the, the crystal clear that I use. I, I have some old, really ugly flower pots. I mean, they're ugly. And, but the pots are still good. They're just ugly. They're all scratched up and crappy looking and they're plastic. But I like them because they, they function well. So I have taken up spraying them. And I have some that are blue and some that are green and, you know, they'll hmm. just, the, the spray lasts a season or two and then I'll take them out in the driveway and lay out some plastic and I'll spray them again. And then when I'm done, I'll spray them with clear plastic enamel and it's, it's like a, a finish on them. You could spray your pine cones or your stars or whatever have you with your clear and then put glitter on them. And that would give you a little more sparkle in your flower pot. So that's kind of a fun thing to do. Done that. Um, think of anything else. Anybody else have some ideas? I've done a lot of chatting. I have another yeah. question. Okay. You know, this year they have the birch logs, but they're on sticks. That looks like that's something new rather than trying to buy the big ones and fit them in your pot. They're on these sticks. Mm -hmm. So is the stick meant to go all the way through the dirt so you don't see, you just see the log? Yeah, I would think you would put the stick in so it would be level with the dirt. You know, the stick, here's your stick, here's your dirt. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the stick would stick up. Yeah. I, that, 
I did see that someplace, especially with the shorter ones. Yeah, these were short. Yeah. So I put them in, but I had, I have, they look like little popsicles. And so <laughs> I sent a picture to my friend who is a garden designer in Naperville at the garden club. And she does a lot of pots. And she sent me a note back. She said, please remove those firecrackers from your pot. And I said, firecrackers? <laughs> Those are birch logs. It was so I thought there's something wrong. So I went back out to the pot and I pushed them down a little bit further. And I thought, yes, she's right. I was trying to get the height, but they did yeah. a little bit better not showing the stick. But at Yonkers today, they had a ton of those and I like the idea. But well, and they have all different lengths, I noticed. I mean, yes. you, you can really yes. get some height or you can really be short or do kind of a mixture. Right. And that there works. Were, yeah, they were a quick resolution to trying to buy the really big ones if you can put those in a really big pot. So yeah. I have a question. Okay. So you're you use the dirt from the summer, you mm -hmm. leave it in the pot. Oh, Do you yeah. reuse that dirt every year then for flowers? I mean, I dump mine every year. Might should I not be doing that? Well, sometimes I dump it completely. Sometimes I don't dump it completely. I'll take off the top layer. And then I'll put fresh dirt on top. And depending on what I'm putting in there and what the pot is, sometimes I'll just use the same old stuff and I'll put awesome coat in it. I'll just mix a good chunk of fertilizer in there and I'll throw the plants in and fertilize them and they seem to do all right. Right. Really? I have I have, I have had geraniums in pots that until we had that really, really, really nasty cold winter about two years ago, I, I had these geraniums every single year. I mean, I had them for eight or 10 years. I just throw them in the garage in the summer, in the winter time, and then bring them back out in the spring. And gradually they'd come back. And by the end of the season, they were monsters. And they were so big, you couldn't get them out of pot. You would wow. really just totally destroy them. So, you know, you know, as you water plants, they, the, the soil kind of sinks down and it gets compacted. And, and I would put some fresh soil on top, but I would always add a, a good slow release fertilizer. Okay. I had to do that. So and I don't really have to be emptying them every year. I uh, empty I them off. I did the same. Yeah, I did the same thing. And it's just a lot of work because I have it a lot is. of time. So yeah. I've done what Susan has done. I've taken out the top layer or so and then just mixed it with new soil. And I use that proven winter fertilizer I got at the farmer's market. And that stuff okay. is just great. So, I, but she's right that taking the pot out every year is just wasting it. And you buy all those bags of soil. So I Yeah, that's that. what I've been doing. Yeah. Yeah, okay. one year. One year I bought 11 bags of the 55 quart. That's the big one. I went through 11 bags. Yeah. This year wow. I went through four. <laughs> Big difference. <laughs> right. Have, you, right. have any of you used um, flowering cauliflower? I think that's what it's called. But I the kale? Can that's you see kale. it? Yeah. The kale. Yeah. That yeah. Is, yeah I've that done is that. so pretty. Yeah. So. No, oh, is that bigger? Need it. I, I once had a customer who grew that in the fall. He had tremendous gardens and he, he cut one for me one year and gave it to me for, you know, for my Thanksgiving dinner table as part of my arrangement. And he said, spray it with air spray. It'll last longer. I never did, but I thought it was an interesting thing to do. Hmm. But this stuff lasts all the way through until I'm ready to get rid of it which is probably April or something. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, World. it lasts a long time. Cool. The other thing I saw done, um, and I saw it at Yonkers, um, I was there for the, a demonstration on flower pots several years ago. And when um, Zandra started filling up the pot, she filled it up with soil and got it just about done. And she put tulip bulbs in the pot and then finished filling it up with soil and then did the arrangement in the pot with all the stuff that you would normally put in, watered it in well. And she said, now in the spring, 
um, you pull this stuff out carefully and you're going to have tulips blooming. I, I never did it because if I have tulips, somebody's going to eat them. But I thought it was an interesting thought and they've got, they've got their bulbs on sale right now. So it's an idea. Very good. Yes. So, good stuff. Um, outdoor discovery. Thank you, Mary. There are workshops tonight at six o'clock. Is anybody going? I'm going. Be, you're going? Be anxious. I want to see a picture of your pot when you're done. <laughs> I have to fill some pots for my church. I always do the ones that are by the, the front door, two pots. Mm-hmm. So I did that last year. My daughter works there. So after everybody had left, she says, come on over because we have a lot of greens left over. So oh. this year I thought I'd sign up and pay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like fun. And then, uh, like I said, Yonkers Open House, it goes through the 21st. So that's this weekend. But they've got lots of stuff. I mean, I, I look at the uh, the poinsettias and I say, no, no, it's much too early for a poinsettia. It would never make it to Christmas in my house. But I bought um, a little a little tree. They have them this year. It was about big. And I, I have a, here I'll grab it. I have this brass container and it's big enough for about three four inch pots and I had to line it with plastic because this doesn't have a plastic liner in it and it is brass um, but I put um, a, a small poinsettia and then this little tree and I think I had an ivy or a fern on the other end and then I put those little itty bitty teeny tiny lights that are battery operated, kind of strung that on it last year. And that was my centerpiece for my Christmas table. And I bought that silly tree. I bought it at, at Yonkers. It was, it was kind of expensive. It was 11 or 12 bucks. And it has a worm. I had it outside in the summer. I had to water it almost every day last year because of the soil that it was in. But I, I put it in a bigger pot and I had it on my uh, one of my end tables on the deck here last summer and it grew and it, it's about so big now and it's in this pot and then um i was where was i walmart and um i think most of you know i had a family of owls and make a visit to me last may they were here all day and it was really exciting and so i found these cute little owls so i have three owls because that's what i had in my tree I had three owls on this little green tree and a little string of lights and <laughs> it's so cute and it's not winter hardy they have them this year and i did ask it's not winter hardy but it's a chartreuse green and it's the cutest little thing and <laughs> i may have to do that again this year but i don't know what i'd do with another tree but um <laughs> you, you don't have to really go to a great extent to do a flower arrangement you can just buy a couple little four inch pots and stick them in a container and and it's beautiful uh, without a whole lot of work and uh, that's that's always a, a welcome thing it's easy so i have a question when i was at yonkers about planting in a pot i bought a red pot i've always wanted to have a red pot so i purchased this red pot they had all their displays in uh there with their evergreens anyway they said i should take some of my old plastic pots and fill them with dirt and then put them in the pot then it's easier to arrange and the pots not so heavy is that a good idea that's a good idea just, I just think. sink a couple of pots in there, then you, you're just not, I don't know. I, I do that with my, my big outdoor pots. I have a plastic pot in the outdoor pot because mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple of the, you know, like that big pot on my front deck. There is right. no way I'm moving that sucker. It's just too big. Right. And the one that's the one that's on the deck, I have a plastic pot in, and that pot, frankly, I'm afraid to move it because it's been out for so many years. It has a very bad crack in it that I, I repaired, and it worked for a few years. Um, I made this wonderful discovery. This, this one's been open from the far end. Minwax stainable wood filler. 
um, comes in a tube and I, I use it with other things. But I had this, this crack all the way down the side of my ceramic pot that's out here on the deck. And I just, I cleaned the pot out, got all the dirt out of the bottom and just filled it up with wood filler. Uh, and it really held. But I, I noticed last summer when I was doing the pot that it's, it's cracked in other places now. So it's not going to last too much longer. But I love that pot. But it's just, it's too big. It's too heavy. You just can't move it. Right. Uh, and I, I think I'm done buying big, heavy, ceramic, beautiful pots that I love because they just don't last. So how big's your red pot, Terry? Oh, gosh, it's, it's, it's pretty big. <laughs> I'm going to put an insert in it. And uh, I mean, it's pretty wide, but I really love the color. And I bought some greens and I bought those stainless steel pot things and I have some long twigs. So I'm going to have fun the next couple of days and just play around with it. But, uh, well, the other, the other thing is um, when you put your, your plastic pot in your ceramic pot, sometimes mm -hmm. your ceramic pot or your plastic pot doesn't quite fit. It's not tall enough. Just put some stones on the bottom. Don't put dirt. Put no, no. I always use yeah. stones. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to try it out. It's a very shiny red. And I just loved it. So I thought, okay, I'm going to have it. So got to have it. <laughs> I have to have it. I'm a pot person. So. You're my kind of person. Got to have it. I have to have, to have it. <laughs> so I'll have fun with it. But the inserts, yeah, that's how I plant my geraniums. I buy them from Harkamos and I just leave them in the 10 inch pots and I just put, sink them into my ceramic pots because they're just getting too heavy to move so many yep. of them. And then I just add that's soil I to the pot. I add additional soil and peat moss and keep it moist. And they just do great all year. So I don't plant directly in the pot. Not too many pots. No. Where do you get your geraniums? Parkamas. I just spelled that. H-A-R-K-E-M-A. Her name is Shelly. She has a little greenhouse. She's only open in the summer. It's right down by Eldine's um, shipyard. Oh. Okay. The back row, but a neighbor when I moved here from Holland years ago told me that's the place to have geraniums, and she does a fabulous job at growing geraniums. And I always buy them from her. I order them um, in April or so, and then you can pick them. She's only open until the end of May, and then she oh, okay. and all she has is annuals, no perennials. But when she closes the last day of May, she sells everything half price. So you can have a lot of fun there if you want some. Um, Plant or pot fillers, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, Shelly Harkema, she's very Shelly. Do you ever? I've done this in the past. I was told I could do this. I and when I have big pots, I put milk cartons or styrofoam halfway up, and then pour the dirt in. Have you guys or done that? Too. Yes. Yes. Oh, I never even thought of mulch, huh? Yes, I've done that. In fact, yeah, Yonkers recommends that too if you're doing a really big pot. Because yeah. I have a big pot on my dock. It's huge. And that's like a couple of bags of soil. And you don't really need right. all that. So I'll do that. Yes. The only issue with that is um, you really have to water them from the top and watch them because then the roots can't pull water up from the bottom if it's yeah. all flat. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Um, well, frankly, just, the other thing I like is mulch. I like to use mulch on the bottom. So I might use a couple inches of mulch and then I put my soil on top. Soil on top of it, yeah. Right. Then when I have to dump them, some of them out, I just put them in my garden. So then I have sort mm -hmm. of a nice compost mix. Yeah. Yeah, I took I took all my pots that I dumped this year and dumped them back in the, the, um, the back 40, as I call it, the extra <laughs> lot that we have that we're planting, planted. That the deer love. I don't know if I could live with that. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, by, by the time September rolls around, I'm starting to feel like, okay, I, I'm, you know, it's the end of summer, so I just let them go. But I had no leaves on any of my hostas. They ate every single leaf. I had, Mama Doe uh, had twins this uh, year. Uh, so I had three full grown deer just having a field day. Well, I Did you try this. plant skid? Yeah, I, I I don't like that stuff, but I, I, I it stinks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I got um I got some other stuff 
at, um, at Menards and one for deer, one for rabbits, and it's about the same stuff. Oh, okay. one's, one's a little heavier on one, one element than the other okay. one, but um, that seemed to work pretty well. I just have to get out and spray, that's all. So I used the granules this year when I put bulbs in, because the, the critters <laughs> ate, they removed every tulip bulb. I didn't have to dig any holes to put daffodils in. Huh? <laughs> they left nice holes, so I thought we'll try that this year. Uh, now my neighbor just planted a huge uh, um, bed of uh, tulips, and she covered it with um, with a tarp. And I thought, why are you doing that? She said, Oh, I read somewhere that animals really know when you've been digging in the ground, and they see fresh dirt and mulch, and they're going to start digging. So she put a tarp over hers for about a month, and I noticed she just removed it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, she just uh, put a plastic over it, and uh, that way no one got it because she had her tulips eaten uh, uh, quite a bit. So, well, when I got done spraying all my rhododendrons for for winter kill, I took my deer spray out and sprayed the deer because if the deer get really hungry, they will eat your rhododendrons. And I really would like to have the few that I have. I'd like to have them bloom this year. Um, so I did spray them and then I will go out probably, you know, we often get a warm up in February, get mm -hmm. a day or two that's warmer. I'll go out and spray everything again in February and mm -hmm. just hope for the best. But I, tulips are just completely out of the question here. I just, yeah. um, one year I, we went to the, the garden show in Chicago mm -hmm. and I fell in love with this one peach colored tulip that had a real frilly edge. I mean, it was just an absolutely gorgeous thing. And I ordered some and I, they never even came up. Somebody just ate the bulbs. Oh, That's yeah. it, I'm done. <laughs> but the yeah, I'm in town and they wiped them out, so. Yeah. Yeah, the, the daffodils, um, they don't like, there is a chemical in, in daffodils that if they, if, if they nip one off, it usually is on the ground, they won't eat it. And you're not supposed to put daffodils in a mixed bouquet because that chemical will kill the rest of the flowers. Mm -hmm. So if you get a, a bouquet of daffodils in the spring, don't put anything in with them. Just let them be beautiful by themselves. Mm -hmm. So. so again with your rhododendron that's interesting you spray it I've had mine for like 25 years now and I've never done anything to it but of course when you have a really cold weather all those leaves just shrivel up they just shrivel up but yeah. they seem well, to be fine they, in the sun when they bloom they're beautiful so, it, but so I, I think some of it depends where they where they are because I, oh, I have okay. some up close to the house and they're protected Okay. But I got a couple okay. that are, they're just totally exposed. And so I thought, well, I didn't get them sprayed last year. And I have a yellow one that I just love. And more and more of it just keeps dying. Okay, so maybe that's the cue. That's the cue then, right. Because mine are right up against the house. Yeah, they, they're protected. So they're, the house is warm. Okay. Uh, when good. we were in Stevensville, I had calla lilies. Oh. And I put these bulbs in the ground and that, you know, calla lilies are supposed to be dug every year and stored. And I put them on the south side of the house and I said, grow and I ain't digging yet. That's all there <laughs> is to it. And they grew and they multiplied and every year they were gorgeous. And I never did a thing to them, but is I think it's right? because they were on the south side of the house. It was a little bit warmer. The house was warm. They got the sunshine. It was fine. So now I have calla lilies in pots. They're and beautiful. Gonna, They're beautiful. I'm going to have to. They are pretty. I'm going to have to dump my pots this year because the pots are just too full, and I don't know. I may just stick them in the ground and see what happens. Susan, I have a question. Okay. I want to know how you planted hundreds of flower bulbs, and your fingernails look so beautiful. Um, <laughs> what's your I secret? Oh, Where the gardening gloves? I do wear gardening gloves and I wear them out and um, I do my nails about once a week. Give okay. or take. Um, I use a base coat. I use a Sally Hansen base coat, um, <laughs> two coats of polish. And then I have a, a top coat that I love. It's called, it's basically, it, it's, it's French, but it's called quick dry, sèche vite. And I order it 
and uh, it, you can use about a half of a bottle and it gets the real thick and icky but you can buy the thinner so you can use it all the way to the bottom and if you have two bottles that are half empty you can dump them together <laughs> <laughs> i'm just not believing that you planted all those bulbs of those fingernails so. yeah well i do gorgeous. <laughs> i do and the other thing is i have an offer um i have a a cluster of holly bushes that have turned into holly trees they're about three oh. stories high <gasps> anyone needs some and they they almost look like red trees right now they are so i can see them right here they're just full of berries if anyone would like to help trim my holly bushes your holly trees you're welcome to, to some branches oh thank you they are gorgeous where do you live i live on lawndale that's um oh. across yeah, do you know where the episcopal church is yeah yeah i know that's lawndale. cherry you get on Cherry. I'm almost at the corner of Cherry and Lawndale. Five five seven. So if you see a stranger walking with a clipper, you know. Well, I've got the long lopper. If anybody wants, so. <laughs> you're very welcome to them. You live right by my son. Yes. Steve, yeah, Steve lives at Elmdale on Cherry. We, He's on we Cherry, drive right yep. into his driveway. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Come on over, Judy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't go there very often. <laughs> no, serious offer. If anyone would like some holly, it lasts beautifully through the season. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful stuff. How do you keep it loose till the season? When I pick ours, the berries dry up. I put a lot of it outside and it lasts. Oh, I time. use it in, well, when I use it indoors, I that's when it, in it happens. Out. But I have such a, I have an endless supply, so I just replace oh. it. Yeah. <laughs> How do you get so many berries on yours? I don't do a darn thing to it. My yeah. art is whatever thrives is on abuse and neglect. Do, do you have a male and a female? Must be. Yeah. Oh, you know. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, the male, the male don't have a berries in it, but you need yeah. both, I think. Yeah, yeah. probably right five there. or six trunks in this cluster. So I have to check it out. The hills. By the way, I had to leave when you were talking early and about the anemones. We have a couple patches of it here. So if anybody wants to come in the spring and see some of our first, first um, there, one of them's right by the driveway um, where you back into to leave our driveway. And then mm -hmm. the other one's out in the garden closer to the tennis court. And there's a few other places too. They're such a welcome site, aren't they? Oh, yo, they're beautiful. I have, I, I pulled up a picture of just a few while ago, and I don't know, maybe I don't have it up here anymore, but um, I don't, it's not a picture of the carpet. It's ours actually looks like a yellow carpet out there. Mm -hmm. they're, they're so full, but. I'm trying to get there. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I must have taken this out of the window. Let's see. Yeah, I don't know if you can beautiful. see that. Mm -hmm. There, it's prettier on the picture than it's showing on there, but and they really like bright the shade, yellow, right? They're almost they like look the like little wax flowers. Mm -hmm. Six petals on a flower. Yeah, they're so pretty. Can you cut them down? Mine are about three feet tall. What's that? My Japanese anemones. Oh, they're oh. white. Oh, are Can they you white? Cut them down? Yeah, well, they're the yeah. ones that bloom now. These are the ones, these are the aconites that bloom oh. in spring. Oh, the, the big, we have the big ones. Yeah, those are real tall. Right. These are right next to the ground. Yeah, these, yeah, these are, these are, they're both anemones. Yeah, can you cut them down, the white ones? Oh, yeah. I cut, I them, cut them, but they don't last. I put them in with some, da with some dahlias and then, the next day, they didn't look good. Yeah, I have pink. I leave them in the garden because I love walking by no, them. I mean, they just kind of bounce around and they're pretty. Well, and they're they're, well, they're I mean, a fall flower where other things don't bloom. Right. Yep. Yeah. That in the monkshood. Yeah. We enjoy yeah. the Landis has several monkshood. I got a, a turtle head this this fall, a pink turtle head, and I'm, I'm anxious to see how that does. Because that's a fall, you know, in the fall, there's, there's, you know, my garden is, 
is pretty much over by fall and you know, you've got some, a few mums that are blooming, but everything else is starting to look not so good. And uh, the, the, the Japanese anemones start blooming, the mums are blooming and the turtle head's supposed to bloom, so. The turtle head, I have one of those and it helps to have it get larger. You know, okay. It spreads and then oh, you good. see it in the distance, but otherwise the flower is fairly small. Yeah. But it's an interesting flower. Yeah, it is. So. I've had mine for a bunch of years and it's. I'm going to take you to Landis' solarium a minute. I'm going to see. I just happen to think this might be, this might work and it might not. But let's see if I can. Yeah, maybe Ooh. there's. It's, we're full of, of things. And then oh, your cactus? Uh, lots of Thanksgiving cactus. Well, they're going crazy hey. right now. Yeah. Here's one of the. I, I, I have a heart there. I don't, it's kind of, they're against the window, so it's kind of hard. But there's uh, the Catalea. And this one's right into the sun, so I'm not sure it's going to look it off. Can you see any of that one? Oh, yeah. yeah. And look at this. <gasps> Wow. Oh, that's the Vanda orchid that hung out all summer out on the Yeah, um, oh my god. The the tree. And this is about um let's see, this must be seven seven different stalks of flowers that we've had. Here's, oh. here's these. And here's a little chocolate. Um yeah, what are those again? The dancing ladies and that one that smells like chocolate. This is kind so hard. Oh yeah, this one has such a pretty little stripe in it. Mm -hmm. So I am so blessed. Oh, yeah, I don't. Vanda. There's one. They are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of quitting it. Oh, I'm going to go. I've got 10 more minutes on the bread. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> I guess stuff over there. Oh, Thank you, Judy. Yes. That was very special. <laughs> Anybody yep. else have any You're muted, Judy. Judy, you're muted. Unmute yourself. This there you was, go. This was, Landis picked these for me two weeks ago, and they were in the, after he dug out the dahlias, he found them in a border. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. He's going to move it to see if we can grow it a little bigger for next year. But it stayed really nice. So maybe I'll even have it yet Thursday. Who knows? And did Karen explain her background? Is that the ones that you took oh. out? Is that a picture you took and, uh, also, yeah, out at the yeah, field? I took, I took that one in Fendel when the poppies were blooming. Yeah, it's and then gorgeous. I used it for a virtual background for this. I've it's never gorgeous. done that, but that's really pretty. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not hard to do. So no? when, you're, when you're done, you have Zoom um, on your laptop or whatever yeah. you're using, and you go into that, and then you, I don't know which button I use, but you go into it, the backgrounds, and then you can just um, put a background in there, take a picture from wherever, put it on your desktop, and then oh. just click on it and put it in your there. So I'll okay, have to try so, that. Maybe so I can take can. a picture of that Vanda orchid. Yeah. So yeah. You can I, download, have pictures, I have pictures of that. So you can download anything that's in your picture album then to get that back. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I'll have to try that. It's really pretty. Yeah. And especially if, if we have windows behind us, you know, mm -hmm. when you're zooming, then you yeah. can't see somebody's face. And that must take care of it for you. You don't have any window. What do you have normally behind you? Um, well, right now, it will be partly patio door, partly. Oh, so it's a wall. Yeah. So it's 
So I like that. I'm gonna have to try that. I have a cousin I've been zoom cousins I've been zooming with, and one of them does that, and they're like scenes in Hawaii and. <laughs> yeah, I have one of the Greek islands with this with the windmills, the Santori windmills or something. Yeah, yeah. Santorini. That one in there. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Santorini. Yeah, it's very Whatever. effective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's fun. Okay. Well, this has been a Thank lot you. of fun, guys. Thank it you. It was. We'll, uh, I think we'll take December off and see if we can figure out something for January to do another call. Uh, I think it's probably going to be a while. Barbara, what's the yes. update? What's the update from uh, from Hass these days? Everything's virtual. Continue. Everything will be virtual for the um, winter spring term. It's. Uh, I, I guess I personally don't think it's going to change that much that we would alter um, meeting together, but we are encouraging any groups or uh, classes or like special events that as soon as we have warm weather, if we can do something outside, that would be fine. Um, but otherwise, we're pretty much just in we just thought it was easier just to say everybody's going to do the same thing rather than trying to make exceptions. Yeah. So, you know, if, if everything all of a sudden turns around and we're all getting healthy, you know, we would change. But uh, I don't know, Terry, what do you think? I don't think it's going to change. No, that I don't. Quickly. I really think we're going to go through this you know, pretty much of 2021, you know, they're starting the vaccine now. I read somewhere where they have already selected four or five states that they're going to start the vaccine in based on the population and the distance of people. And uh, Michigan is not on the list. So <laughs> and we're supposed um, to be so heavily. Yeah, but they're doing, I think it's like remote areas like Tennessee, Rhode Island, Oh, I think Louisiana, there were two more, two more states. Um, mm-hmm. But until we really know the vaccine is going to be effective. I mean, Hope College is doing the same thing. We're coming back and we're just going to be remote. But right. I think till you know how the vaccine works, how many people can get it and can we still be to... really safe? It's hard. I thought, I thought I would wait till after the holidays to contact the um, I forget this guy's name now at the um, at the the new greenhouse, which we were going to do last March. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, if that's OK with the rest of you, I think uh, it's possible that we would be able to do that because it's it's in a greenhouse, but it's fresh air. I mean, really almost outside. So and if you were in a small group. And they would divide us into two smaller groups if we had like 20 people. So that would be nice. I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do uh, as far as that. I just didn't want to go ahead and make arrangements at this point. Maybe we'll know a little bit more in January also as to what any other recommendations are as for how many people can be together and et cetera, that sort of thing. Right. Well, I think that would be fun. By March, we're all going to want to get our hands in the dirt. <laughs> At least I will. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> well, we were going to do that sort of near the end of March. And I know they're planning to have two at time, but it'll be uh, slimmed down. Mm-hmm. They'll still be doing stuff with two. You know, I mean, they're already planted all in, in town. So. so anyway, well, we'll talk in January about that then. Okay. Right. Sounds good. All right. Well, everybody have a I have fabulous one more thing. Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, as chair of the events committee, and since we mentioned um, Mary and I and Barb attends our meetings too, but um, we had a really good time with our trivia game. And there was an article in the last newsletter or the one, maybe it hasn't come out yet. But anyway, there's an article in the newsletter that tells about that. And we're going to try to have another evening um, December 15 for the holiday. 
So think about that and join us. That, that really was fun. We got to know some new people because we broke up into smaller groups, kind of like we're doing right now. And um, it, it, it worked, worked out really well. Right, good. We had a really good, good time. We only had, we had about 36 people or 36 units, I should say. Some of them were couples and some were singles. But um, so think about that, put a December 15 on your calendar as a possibility and then register when you see it come. It'll come in the newsletter and it'll come um, in, uh, in a constant com contact. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. Great. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Susan. It was very informative. Yeah. Oh, good. Great. Happy thank Thanksgiving. You. Have fun. Have a great Thanksgiving, and we will chat in January. I'm I'm always here if you need something. <laughs> if I can help with anything, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, great guys. Bye -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Hi, ladies. Have a nice day. Oh, Thank hi, you. Susan. Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. Take care.